I do have a copy of the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> Definitely a fed. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we put and shared one of your one of your videos, and I watched. I'm like, I like what he has to say. You know, he's, this is a pretty good dude. So I asked Fred later that Saturday when we usually do these. I said, Hey, do you want to ask your brother-in-law if he wants to come do one of these with us? He said, yeah, I'll ask him. And apparently he asked you because you're here. But, uh, oh, I thought we, it was beamed, uh, beamed up from Scotty. <laughs> we were, we were <laughs> texting last night. And Fred was posting a bunch of memes and other stuff. And I was playing video games with my, with my boy. We were playing Cards 3 racing. I was mm -hmm. blowing him up with rockets and stuff. It was pretty cool. I kick his ass. But, uh. I, I looked down at the conversation. I noticed that Dave had been awful quiet. I'm like, Dave's been awful quiet over there. Are you a fan? I didn't hear anything back for a minute still. <laughs> hmm. I ask everybody if they're a fan, so. Because the, the law is they have to tell you, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the rule book. if you ask a cop if they're yeah, a cop, how it works? they have to tell you. <laughs> but you said... You said you're not a cop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice little Parks and Rec's ref there reference there. Is that in Parks and Rec? I didn't remember. Yeah, it's. Um, I was. I got mine from Breaking Bad. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, what's? It's the uh, character played by uh, uh, Chris. Uh, Chris Pratt. Um, <laughs> yeah, Chris Pratt is awesome. Andy. Yeah, Andy. Chris Pratt is so good in that show. So when they go to DC, although although he's also great in Guardians of the Galaxy, well, I, I love Chris Pratt. He's awesome. We're at the mall. Oh, good! I need to go get some new flip flops. <laughs> so when, we, when I was in DC with my mom last last year to do Reese across America, where we put uh, the Reese on the graves at Arlington. First day there, we go to the mall, and we get up. We get off the what do they call the train? Whatever they call the train. Yeah, the metro. In D.C.? Yeah, metro. Yeah, I get off the metro and go up the escalators. We get up there and immediately get accosted by two guys up at the top of the stairs and they start talking to us. One of them gives me this Trump beanie and, oh, cool, whatever. This is weird. Where I come from, people don't just, sh you know, shove stuff in your hand. Especially so merch. I so I just put it in my pocket. I don't know. I'm from the middle of nowhere. I get confused driving in Salt Lake City because they have signs that I've never seen before. <laughs> hey, they give us you mean like Caesar Chavez Boulevard. <laughs> yeah, sure. Is that place in Salt Lake City? Yeah, they also have Harvey Milk Boulevard. Hell yeah, yeah, yeah. Utah's not corrupt. <laughs> and so, and Salt Lake City's not run by communists. No, no. Hey, this is Mitchell Story Time, so just zip it. Oh, <laughs> So, anyway, we're up there, and these, these guys are talking to us, blah, 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 and I'm, I put that beanie in, my, in the pocket of my hoodie, and they're like, you guys from around here? I'm like, no, we're not from around here. Do I look like I'm from around here? Everybody's wearing parkas. I'm wearing a hoodie. Anyway, you know, they're like, where, where, where are you trying to go? I said, well, we're trying to go to the mall. You're on the mall. Like, what? And so it's like nothing that I had expected, because, I mean, there's like dirt trails and stuff there on the mall. It's not all paved and everything, which is kind of, you know, what I expected. Mm -hmm. And I get up there, and he says, you're on the mall, brother. What the hell? So I look, <laughs> and we're, if I remember right, when you come up the escalator and you get there, you're facing a building, if I remember right. So you don't really see, and you're just kind of looking around, and people are talking to you. And so, you know, I kind of look down one way, and there's, there's the Washington Monument. Now I look over there, and there's the capital. Oh, shit, we are on the mall. That's cool. All right, well, thanks, guys. And I tried to walk off. The guy's like, you got 20 bucks for that beanie? I'm like, what? No, I don't have 20 bucks for the beanie. So, I'm going to need that back. I'm like, then why'd you give it to me? <laughs> I was so confused. It was just so weird. You got some money for that hat, brother? No, I don't have money for the hat. I'm not paying you for something that you gave me. So I gave it back to him like a chump, and then we went over to the Washington Monument. You, you ever you ever drive through a city and have a, a random window washer uh, pop up on your car? Nope, I don't go to the city. Yeah. 
that 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 actually happens in big cities. You, the biggest city ever. Ran, random was. homeless people will walk up with a dirty rag, start cleaning your windshield with a dirty rag, and expect you to pay them. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> the only big city I've ever driven in. Salt Lake City. Big cities suck. I hate big cities. I don't like them. <laughs> I, I just showed you where I live. There's nothing here, and it's beautiful. What I are you talking out. about? There's tons of chunks of concrete here. Right here. Yeah. This isn't like everywhere. It's only select locations. Although I, I am curious as to who thought it was a good idea to reinforce the concrete with sticks. I mean, like, some of them don't even have rebar. It's just like wooden wooden dowels through it. Oh, that's still. No, oh, there, there was one over there. With wood? Yeah, with wood sticking Oh, that's out. your tax dollars at work. Oh. <laughs> good job, you dot. <laughs> Super proud of your dumb asses. <laughs> you dot. Oh, Being hey. idiots since the beginning of Utah. By the way, we lost four million dollars. We lose four million dollars. I what? lose four bucks. And I know about it. <laughs> For a government, I'm that's super, easy, man. But I'm super cheap too, so. I mean, after all, we just sent ten million dollars to Pakistan so they could learn uh, about gender. <laughs> they can go ahead. <laughs> but <sighs> so the whole foreign aid thing. There's no reason. So we're, we're what twenty. 27 trillion in debt. The United States is 27 trillion. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know that I know that I heard just yesterday that we're we've got about seven or eight trillion dollars just in bonds alone. Oh, that's cool. Outstanding. So why are we still giving money to other countries? You know what's interesting? The I've, money that I haven't even earned yet. Oh yeah, but I've I've heard that China actually has a ton of uh, a ton of debt that we own as well. So. I heard that the, the Treasury started buying up land bond, like mortgage, uh, what do you call them? Mortgage securities? Securities, yeah. They've been doing that for a long time. Not at the rate that we, like, I think they, they dropped, like... They've been doing that since the 30s. What, what do you think, anyway. what do you think Freddie Mac is? Is it a computer? Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, the, that's the... <laughs> That's the government banks that buy up all the mortgages in this country. So technically, we're all serfs to the federal government. Mm -hmm. We have been for a long we time. We think that we own our houses. We're free range. But unless unless you have it fully, unless you have your mortgage fully paid off, you're you're subservient to the federal government. Even then, you're still not. You're still subservient to the local government because if you don't pay your property property taxes, taxes they can seize it. Yeah. Take that shit away from you. Wow. No, it it. It really just makes and up mad. until now, I was feeling like all excited about being like a free American. <laughs> it turns out I'm a slave. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the illusion that everybody's on under. They're like, yeah, we're free. No, we're not. You have to ask permission to do everything but take a leak anymore. Man, I keep just wanting to say something like, when in the course of human events. <laughs> well, that's. You know, when we was uh, at episode six or something like that, we did it over at your property. And, and I guess, and I guess really we've been going for like ten minutes already. So I guess maybe we should say, "Hi, I'm Dave." Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> this is Dave. Nobody's interested. He's, he's got a, a <laughs> podcast as well. Yeah, so if you want to check out my We're podcast, all here. I know. <laughs> So if you if you two want to check out my podcast, it's Colorblind Architect Podcast. Uh, you can check it out on Rumble.com. Uh, YouTube's good too. It's just you know, I don't know. Uh, as far as I as far as I go with this whole thing, I don't really care where people go to listen to it as long as they go to listen to it and you know try and expand our understanding and you know what what our founding documents mean and what it means to be an American and, you know, to be free. Mm-hmm. You know, that's... I don't care where you hear the message. I don't care if we're ever on a platform where we get monetized. But, uh... Yeah, I... Check out Dave's, uh... Dave's videos and podcasts. He does a really good job. I like his stuff. Oh, that's what I've been saying from the beginning of my podcast as well, is that I don't expect to ever make a single cent from from doing this, because um, what got me started... I mean, I, I, I've toyed with the idea of starting a podcast for years, but um, what really put me over the edge was this summer with the riots and just the, the disinformation campaigns 
by the uh, by the media and po- you know politicians it just pushed me over the edge and I felt like I needed to speak out and especially when I went on a rant on Facebook back in June early June right after the George Floyd Floyd riot started um, and I I went I went a bit more politically incorrect than I usually try to be because I try to be polite on Facebook because I know that I've got a lot of friends who are not um, not of my political persuasion and you know I, I don't I don't want to necessarily ruffle feathers just for no reason you know I mean it's I mean I, I've kind of changed since then because uh, frankly now I don't give a shit <laughs> it's like <laughs> Um, if you're not ruffling feathers, are you really getting your point across? And, and the truth is always going to be offensive. And that's that's really what got me started. Was I just I I had had enough. I just couldn't take the bullshit anymore, and I I just needed to speak out and say the truth as I see it. And you know I I'm I'll be the first one to recognize. Yeah, a lot of times I'll get it wrong, but you know what? I'm still going to call it how I see it. I'm still going to say what I think is true. And, you know, one of the things that I really appreciate about what you guys are doing is you're you're actually trying to break apart the Constitution into bite-sized chunks and actually explain it, which is great. And, and I, I hope there's a lot of other people doing that as well. I think I think there are based on what I've been seeing on YouTube and uh, and on Rumble and, and on, on Parler and other sources. There's a lot of people waking up, which is, which is exciting. Unfortunately, um, I don't think enough people are waking up. I think it's still a very small minority. I feel like we're we're, uh, I, I feel like we're the three hundred selected by the Lord. <laughs> you know, like um, that. There's very few of us actually. You know, keeping our eyes. You know watching out for the uh, enemy while drinking the water from the stream if you know what i mean mm-hmm. nice little bit bible reference there so but yeah feels pretty lonely sometimes <laughs> it can yeah you know, and just i don't know you know it just seems like people don't really care because i mean and we use this example a lot because it's one of the easiest ones to make but like with Herbert and his mandates and everything with the uh, COVID. May he go pound sand. Hey Amen. <laughs> um, so you sit there and you say, well, he can't just do that. He can't just make it law. And you have that argument with people. And like, well, yeah, he can. I'm like, no, he can't. There's no authorization given in the Constitution for emergency powers to do anything. Let alone for an emergency to last more than 30 days, according to the Utah State Constitution. Yeah. Uh huh. So, and they're like, well, they've passed laws to make it, to make it so. I'm like, where? Even if they have passed a law, <laughs> if that law is unconstitutional, it has no grounds, it cannot stand. Because, like we said before, either the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and you hold it that way, or it's not. But so, which is it? Are we still yeah, a constitutional republic? See, that's the problem, Mitch. You just want people to die. You're you're a hate monger. <laughs> well, <laughs> people have died all throughout human history. Mm-hmm. That's never going to stop. Kind of sign up for it when you get born. Except for me, I made a deal. Yeah, contract. Was it was it with blood? Don't worry about it. <laughs> but yeah. And so the pe- people are always telling me, they're like, yeah, he can do that. No, he can't. We have three separate but equal branches of government that all have their own job, and you can't have them doing each other's jobs. Well, if, if people like you would just do the right thing, then they wouldn't have to. No, if people like you would just stop, you know, being a good little... A good little... Uh, Goody two-shoes? No, friendly. Uh, subject. I, I, I had a few brain injuries. A good, a good, yeah, like a, an, obedient, being a good... an obedient subject. Yeah, yeah. That, that's actually something that uh, I, I brought consent. that up. I brought that up to um, to our elders quorum in a class a couple weeks ago. Um, so we is we've been doing Zoom uh, Zoom meetings for uh, elders quorum uh, as a lot of people are, 
and for those not of our faith, you know, that's basically Sunday school for adults, uh, for the adult men, right? Anyways, um, in our in our Sunday school class, I'm uh, we we got to this one point where I asked the question concerning uh, Romans thirteen one, and if you're familiar with that verse, that's the one where uh, Paul says that we should be subject uh, subject to kings and rulers, um, and and that the reason why because the laws are just because if it, if it wasn't they wouldn't have been ordained of God to be the rulers. And my question to everybody was, well, um, so would the would the uh, Declaration of Independence have ever happened? Would the re would the American rebellion against the uh, British Crown have ever happened had the founding fathers abided by Romans thirteen one? Dead silence for like five minutes. Nobody could respond. Nobody, I mean, like, everybody was just flabbergasted by the question. I was just, and that, that was eye-opening to me. It was really eye-opening to me that so many of my friends and neighbors in, in my ward were, like, they had never thought about what it would take to actually come to the point where you feel that it is right and, um, and righteous to rebel against your governor, uh, your government, um, because God is asking you to. And the 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 my response to it was, okay. Well, let me let me put it this way. Think of Nephi killing Laban. He committed murder. He freaking committed murder, and not just any murder. It was an assassination. And why did he do it? Because he was constrained by the spirit of the Lord. So the Spirit of the Lord told him to kill somebody? Yeah, sometimes sometimes the Spirit of the Lord will lead us to do things. But when, I followed it up uh, by telling the group, that that's why we better make for damn sure we are close enough to the Spirit, that we're attuned to the Spirit, so we're not taking the wrong message from the wrong messengers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it, especially for people in the church, it gets kind of confusing because we believe in you know, being peaceful and, you know, one of our article faith, articles of faith, so we believe in being subject to kings, rulers, presidents, magistrates, mm -hmm. and so people think that we should just always just obey the law, you know, well, we're supposed to obey the law, well, if that law is just, moral, and righteous, then yes, we should obey the law. If it's not, I have no obligation to follow that law at all. You know, the the people hiding the Jews in Europe in the early 40s were breaking the law. The SS guards killing them were following the law. Law is not a good indicator of morality and what's right and wrong. Law is written by men. They almost always seek to gain more power for themselves. Hmm. I don't know. Heard heard that somewhere. I don't know. Something like uh, Doctrine and Covenants, uh, Section One Twenty One, or something. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, references references for us to that we're meant to be free and govern ourselves are everywhere in you know any scripture that you read that's we're meant to and intended to rule ourselves and that's the entire basis of our republic is individual liberty but people like to use their uh, you know self-righteousness to say that believing in your individual liberty is more important than caring about somebody's safety you know that's selfish well, maybe, but uh, but these yeah. are the same people who are telling us that it's okay to kill a bunch of babies mm -hmm. in the womb. These are the same people who are telling us that it's okay to block the hormones of children because oh well, they need to be able to select their gender. 
never mind the uh, n never mind the physical uh, harm that that's causing those children to have them transition you know while they're still a child yeah I mean once they're an adult I don't give a crap if you want to do that whatever just don't tell me about it you know but we shouldn't be having children destroying their future based on the fact that they're three years old and it little Tommy wants to put on a dress and it's like yeah yeah that sometimes happens He's a kid. they also sometimes think that they're dogs or Plans. birds or choo-choo trains you know three-year-olds say a lot of really crazy stuff <laughs> the thing that's most uh disgusting to me is the parents who push their kids in that direction for the social um the social credit credit themselves. yeah and it's like look how good of a parent i am i'm i'm allowing my kid to insert whatever agenda that is and it's just like you're a disgusting human like you're you you're a disgusting person and it comes back to the fact that people have divorced themselves from god they've divorced themselves from religion um and you know i i understand that i mean i i get it it's hard to believe in god i mean it's it's not something that you just naturally are going to stay believing in god when you've got so much crap going on that makes you really doubt but if you're not doubting god then you're not trying to have faith in god um, you you have to you have to question God because if you don't you're being a moron it's like <laughs> the atheists who are like oh yeah well if you believe in God why do bad things happen to good people it's all just part of God's plan right that's why there's all the starving kids in Africa part of his plan it, I didn't make the plan I'm just and yet they're perfectly willing to believe in the matrix and the, and this being a simulation well, if it's a simulation, then what does it matter if the kids in Africa are starving? Hello? <laughs> because it's not even real, right? It's just a simulation. I call that mental masturbation. <laughs> it really is. Like, it's just you're mentally trying to give yourself the... There, there's a guy that I work with, and he was like... In our stand-ups, our daily stand-ups, we do usually like a fun thing. And he, one of the things he did was like, "Oh, let's give me, give me some kind of fact or something that will." He's like, "That is tantalizing." And I was like, "Basically, you just want mental masturbation." And, and he was like, he was like at first scandalized, but he's like, "Yeah, I guess that's right." Yeah. Speaking of mental masturbation, have you ever heard of the multiverse? Yep. Yeah, that's that is literally a theory drawn up to explain how this improbable world with human and intelligent life, well, supposedly intelligent life, um, can even exist. Because f from the statistical probability... Well, allegedly. From a statistical probability, it is next to impossible for us to even exist without some kind of divine intervention so what do they do they create this thing called the multiverse which basically posits the idea that you have an infinite number of universes all parallel all happening at the same time and we just happen to be in one of the universes that just happens to have intelligent life um be, by 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 random happenstance and my thought is so okay You've got the Big Bang Theory, which has already been proven... It's already being proven to be a, li a bit off. Um, not necessarily saying that it's been disproven. I'm just saying it's, it's a bit off in the fact that, according to the Big Bang Theory, the predictive models based on the math, we should be collapsing in on ourselves as a universe it, because of the force, the forces pulling things back in, right? But yet we've been accelerating in our expansion. So it defies logic. So what do they do? They invent the multiverse for one to explain life. And then what do they invent to explain the expansion of the universe? They invent this thing called dark matter. Well, what is dark matter? Well, it's literally, it's literally a variable that they throw into the mathematical formulas that they use. To make it work. So that it will work. <laughs> and I'm like... You know, I remember my math teachers, if I tried to pull that shit in class, they would have given me an F. <laughs> I, I, 
I mean, yeah, gr granted, I, I understand. It's theoretical physics. So you kind of have to invent some math. But to base a whole system of belief that we're supposed to just believe what we're being taught. We're supposed to believe that, oh, yes, it is absolutely this way. And, yes, this this does prove that there is no God because, yeah, we've got this Big Bang Theory. And it's like... I, I, I think there's still some questions I'd like to ask. <laughs> we actually talked about the Big Bang Theory a little bit Just last we, week, and I said I don't know any better, so I kind of... You it's know, also I kinda, a really shitty sitcom. I kind of believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I kind of believe it just because I don't know very much about it in the first place. So I mean, but the main takeaway of that was, what does it really even matter to us? Yeah. And and the argument that I made about atheists is saying, well, this proves there's not God. Do you ever think that God's just maybe you know being all knowing and and all that? Do you think maybe he was really good at math? Just a theory. <laughs> Well, there is that theory out there, right? The space aliens. And see, now we go into uh, Joe Rogan territory. Let's talk space aliens. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Well, we got to get some DMT in here. <laughs> oh, but, yeah. Well, we, yeah, we can bring up the DMT stuff, too. I've never done it myself, so I, I, I can't speak to that. But on the space alien question, um, you know, there's a lot of people who theorize that it was space aliens that planted humans on Earth. I watched the documentary about that. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what if those space aliens just happened to be, you know, I don't know, uh, the Archangel Michael and uh, Jehovah? I don't know. Just, just thinking. These stories sound loud. real familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. Just, just a thought. You know, I mean, think that I've really heard the same story, but just like differently. Yeah, just, just a different flavor. You know. I believe in aliens. As for DMT, yeah, I have absolutely no clue on that. Closest I ever came to that was smoking marijuana when I was a teenager, and I can say, yeah, it, it's. It's cool and all, but I prefer I, I, I prefer my mind to be clear. <laughs> I've never smoked marijuana. People are blown away when I tell them that. I've never smoked pot. Never done any kind of drug. I'm not surprised. I've only ever been... There's tons of people who haven't. The only time I've ever been high is after, like, surgeries and stuff like that. And, you know, I really don't get the, get the hype because I make an ass of myself. More so than usual. <laughs> yeah, that was... That... <laughs> That was my conclusion as a teenager that, hey, wow, this whole alcohol and m marijuana thing, yeah, kind of... I'm an idiot sober. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 don't, I, I don't like this lack of self-control thing that it causes. <laughs> you know, sometimes you get drunk on a beach in Florida and pass out naked and get sunburns in places you don't want to get sunburns. Do tell, I think it's Mitch's story time again. No, uh, this isn't family appropriate. <laughs> That's why we make these explicit. I think we already have to mark this one explicit. <laughs> We've already... The people who watch it, they might be like, yeah, it's marked explicit, but hey, there's nothing ever busy. really... Oh! <laughs> oh, it's funny. funny. One of my videos, I actually marked explicit. Zero views. Not a single one. I'll tell you the story after we're done. <laughs> It involves like a week's worth of binge drinking, drinking right after I got home from my first tour. There's a battleship and everything. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> it's a great story. I actually told the story the other day. I, I'm very interested about this story. Oh, you'll love it. Okay. You've never actually told me this story. I've never told. Oh my gosh. No. Well, maybe I should um, come up here more often, <laughs> provoke some more stories out of Mitch. <laughs> yeah. Let's put some feelers out there right now to our pretend audience. If anybody wants to hear my stories about my drunken adventures right after my first tour before I came home and sun, sun burning my willy and touring a battleship and meeting, <laughs> meeting homeless people living under a bridge, just say, I want to hear the story. Tell us on Facebook or wherever else you can get a hold of us and I'll tell the story. Well, since I'm the uh, viewing audience, I, I vote yes. <laughs> There's a couple other people. Oh, My are? mom watches these. Oh. <laughs> oh, maybe I shouldn't cuss so much. <laughs> I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> I am what I am. If you don't like it, tough shit. I don't really care. 
The only thing I do is try not to say the F word, and so far I've been successful. I was really mad one day, though, when we were doing this, and I almost did. I was so mad. We were talking about the VA. Oh, man. Anyway, but yeah, we, uh... Well, I, I, I avoid the F word for a different reason. <laughs> because uh, my my wife is Romanian just like uh, Fred's wife, and in Romanian, the F word uh, actually just means I do or I make. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. It's kind of a common word in that language. You use it all, literally all the time. Well, that's one of those words that is, uh, you know, if you hear an American speaking it, it's one of those words that is just very universal. It's almost verbal everybody, masturbation. Everybody knows what it is. <laughs> everybody knows what it is. You start saying that, and if you're mad, people are like, oh, wow, this guy's mad. He's really impressive. But then you go to England, and everybody says it just as like a... Nobody gives a shit about England. They've lost. <laughs> you know, in their eyes, uh, the Founding Fathers were terrorists. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We've talked about that, about the Founders more or less being degenerates. They were uh, bootlegging alcohol, running guns, blowing shit up. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what we're descended from. Our, our, our country was born from violence and uh, insurrection and, England and defiance. Wasn't. I mean, I don't know enough. I I know about the Vikings going to England. My ancestors. Oh, they were violent too. Yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah we were. I mean, the whole idea that any culture wasn't violent is just it, it's it smacks of the fish were kind of violent, idiocy. but they also sucked. So, well, you know, one of my favorite lines from the movie uh, um, Braveheart. Is when the uh, 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 Edward Longshanks, the king, re uh, refers to the French, <laughs> and he's he says um, their uh, their uh, their 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 Gaelic laziness mixed with their Latin voluptuousness means they would l rather make love to their faces than to make war. <laughs> uh, that sums it up. My wife told me stories about her. Her grandpa was in World War Two, and he landed on Omaha Beach the day after D-Day, and so he, you know, he was there for the whole advance through Europe and everything. And he was actually he actually stood guard when the Germans surrendered. He was one of the guards there. Um, anyway, so he was he would tell stories about how as they were advancing through through France, the French would actually like throw themselves in in front of them and. Like beg them not to kill the Germans. It's like, well, maybe you just deserve to be occupied then. <laughs> if you're not willing to kill and die for your freedom, you don't deserve it. And yet, right now, if you actually look at Europe right now, France is actually one of the more ant, you know, the the more freedom loving countries, despite having a socialist president. It's weird how the the so called right wing government in in England right now under Boris Johnson and the so-called right-wing government uh, government un, under Angela Merkel they're all in on the great reset and the mask mandates and all that stuff and in France they're just like screw you we're doing our own thing <laughs> well, this whole thing everything that's going on in all these countries and even here you know it's all about the it's all about the control it's all about the one world government and so they infiltrate into all these conservative um, parties and everything, and then they just slowly change direction. And most people are not smart enough or don't care enough to look into it and see where everything's going. They just, my parents were, were Republicans or Democrats, and so am I. And this, this, this he's, they're going to save us. This election's all about voting for the lesser of two evils. This is the most important election of our lifetime. People have been voting for the lesser of two evils for over 150 years. But guess what? When you keep voting for the lesser of two evils, it 
Just still get evil. Evil just continues to perpetuate. Well, that's exactly what this past election was for. I think everybody. I mean, whether you whether you were for you know whether you voted for Trump or for Biden, either way, you were voting for the lesser of two evil. You, I don't. Very few people, except for the uh, except for the real true Trump uh, Trumpists. You know, like the ones who believe Trumpist, he can do. That's a great term. The, I, and I'm talking about like the Trump, the the Trumpists who like think he's got this grand master plan. You know, to to you know, and he's gonna you know save the country. You know, uh, uh, thanks to this grand master plan. I don't think he has a grand master plan. I I don't I don't think Trump is that kind of guy. Of course guy. he does. Have you seen his come over? He's got a master plan. <laughs> You have to talk that up. <laughs> Not yet. No, thanks. Good. But, I mean, I guess my point is most people, I think, voted either for Trump because they they felt like Biden was, you know, dangerous and um, and he's, he's in violation of the emoluments clause of the Constitution, which is my position, is that he is very much in bed with the Chinese Communist Party due to donations uh, well, not uh, just them. Very large sums of money. There's so many places. That oh, dude, oh, oh, I know. That Every, dude's dirtier than a Ukraine, two-cent hooker. I mean, Ukraine, Russia, I mean, Kazakhstan. I mean, like, a lot of these, country, a lot of these countries gave the Bidens tons of money. All through, you know, mostly through Hunter. But... And we're supposed to believe that, you know, Joe didn't get anything out of it, even though he's been on a senator's salary and a vice president's salary for 47 years and yet has like six mansions or something. <laughs> I'm like, OK, I know I, I know a couple hundred thousand dollars a year is a really good salary, but it's not enough to buy a mansion, let alone six. They're just really good at math. Well, they did. He did save a lot of money on cars by taking Amtrak to Washington, right? <laughs> so, and then of course, on the flip side, you know, you have the uh, uh, the people who voted for Biden. They weren't voting for Biden. They were voting against Trump. They they wanted Orange Man Bad out. They they saw him as um, a big orange fascist, and they needed to get him out. He and says mean things. And yeah, exactly. He he tweets horrible things at three in the morning while on his toilet. And it's like, yeah, so does anybody else who tweets at three in the morning on their toilet. Twitter should not be used in conjunction with a toilet. <laughs> I do that stuff when I'm on the toilet. I don't yeah, have... But it should never be Twitter. <laughs> I don't have said Twitter. Just kidding. I... <laughs> If you did have a Twitter account, I'd, I'd probably uh, think lesser of you. <laughs> I have a Facebook. That uh, I share lots of things on Facebook. Yeah, I kind of feel like Facebook is one of those ones where you just kind of have because you, you you almost have to because all your friends and family are on that. That's where they post all the family pictures and stuff, and so you basically... I don't care about that. You, I, I never... care about people knowing where I stand on things. Ah, That's okay. also, they haven't kicked me off yet, so I still... Can... You're waiting for the date. Because my original reason for getting on Facebook was exactly that. The whole blogging, family blog thing kind of fell out of favor when Facebook came out. Because that's what we would do. And as a result, we were no longer able to follow... We, we were na no longer able to follow uh, the happenings of our extended family. You know, like cousins and stuff like that. You know, who... You know, we want to keep in touch with them. But they were like 2,000 miles away. I mean, you know... So, where... How to, how to keep up with them. So Facebook was a really convenient way for that. And that's kind of how it started for me having Facebook. There's still a lot of really good uses and a lot of good potential for Facebook. But, yeah. um, I, I share a lot of my thoughts and ideas. And... But I definitely wish Candace Owens the best of luck with her lawsuit against Facebook. Because, <laughs> man, if she could knock out those stupid fact-check warnings through this law. I mean, so somebody, those things are horrible. Somebody posted on Facebook, one of my friends, um, this whole big thing about Joe Biden being a war hero and saving a puppy from a burning building and all this other just flagrantly <laughs> just lies. Not a single fact-check. <laughs> <laughs> I should try like, that. <laughs> really? This is interesting. But no, you know, I, I share um, like the, what it means to 
being American and being free and you know a lot of the stuff that we talk about here I share those kind of those thoughts and ideas on Facebook and I hear back from a lot of people like yeah I really like I really like how you look at things and how you feel things and you know your what you're saying is right um, and I never would have thought of thought so, of that so, like, so circle that's nice. back to a conversation earlier we were having about the the, the People not standing up and 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 speaking up. Have you found that, like in in being more vocal on Facebook, have you found in your circle of friends, have you gotten a lot of quiet private messages saying thank you for speaking out, and and mm -hmm. and, and yet you never see them speak up? Because <laughs> I get that all the time. Yeah, I get that a lot, and I hear a lot from the guys that I work with and from family and stuff when I talk to them. They're like, "Good for you." I'm like. It's you like, can do it too. It's not that hard. If people get upset, that's their problem. That's not really my problem. That's I don't like what you had to say. Oh, guess what? I had the First Amendment, so shut up your ass. I don't care if your feelings are hurt. Well, I, I remember this one post I made. I, I, I just simply, uh, simply wrote out the line, the Democratic Party is a criminal organization, full stop, period. Both. Both parties. And... Man, the responses I got from some of my leftist friends and family. Um, but you know what? They couldn't They couldn't actually argue against what I said. All they could do is, you're being so divisive. I'm like, good. Okay. A am I saying anything wrong? I mean, are they, are, they, are they actually clean of criminality? Because it sure seems to me like the organization that formed the Ku Klux Klan... Um, is most certainly a criminal organization. <laughs> yeah, let's let's speak about that for a minute. The, uh, the left always loves to say how um, conservatives and the right wing is the uh, you know Nazis and racists and everything like that. When racism and fascism and all that is a far left political ideology. It's not mm -hmm. a conservative ideology. It's far left. So everybody who says that they're conservative and believes in racism, they're not really conservative. Exactly. It's a far left ideology. And and that comes that comes to another question. What what do you define conservatism as? Personally, uh, I believe conservative conservatism as standing um, believing in what our nation is supposed to stand for. You know, individual liberty, personal rights, personal responsibility, um, conserving and leaving it the way that it's supposed to be. So, so I guess what to 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 sum it up, I, I, it sounds like you're saying to believe in the words of the Declaration of Independence, where we, all, you know, all men are created equal mm -hmm. and endowed by their Creator with inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yep. Okay. That's that, exactly how I believe. I, I think that's a fair definition. Um, classical liberals would probably disagree with you, but the classical liberals are usually not real. Well, a lot of conservatives <laughs> they're, they're kind don't of a necessarily fairy. believe that either. A lot of cons conservatives, I've found, are actually quite liberal in their thinking and their ideologies, but they think that they're conservative. Like, uh, another, one, another, one of the for instance, that we use a lot is with the Second Amendment, because it's pretty easy. Um, you have a lot of conservatives that are like, yeah, I think people should be able to own guns. Yeah, but not that type of gun. But, but not <laughs> machine guns. Within but, reason, that's what they're... That's the, I, that's I the support rhetoric. the Second Amendment, but you sound like you're about to say something really stupid. <laughs> so go ahead and stop yourself right now. And that's that's the point that, that I try to make. You know, a five a five gallon bucket, a five gallon bucket of con you know full of concrete could be turned into a lethal weapon very easily. I'm just saying, it's not the tool that you use; it's the intent behind the use of the tool. Well, I've I've apparently done a pretty good job of getting people to understand that we should be able to own machine guns and mortars and all you know explosives and. And stuff like that because a lot of people. If you could afford it, would you buy a tank? Yeah, 
Oh yeah, I'd buy a tank. Dude, I was artillery in the <laughs> army. Too. I would love. Uh, uh, that would be so much fun. <laughs> I was in the artillery for nine and a half years, and we could send uh, 150 pound projectile 18 and a half miles away and land it in a dumpster. So yeah, I'd buy a tank. <laughs> nice. There's nothing quite like rolling around. Just blowing shit up here and there. I've watched Iraqis try to fight the Abrams. It never worked out for them. Freaking shoot RPGs at them, and they'd either bounce off or they'd blow up. The and then the tanks would run through it. houses and over walls and shit, and they'd shoot at them with very case. For the most part, didn't the didn't the insurgents have to like use uh, like uh, improvised uh, explosive devices and trick you at checkpoints or something? Yeah, they did a lot of that. They're they they had a lot of different a lot of different tactics. See, when I first got over there on my first tour, we were only three years into the war, um, and they had just barely started using the IEDs. And, and stuff like that when I first got over there and then they really started especially in our area because I was in Ramadi and we didn't have that area locked down so they were pretty free to just kind of do whatever they wanted with their little you know camel loving games and uh, so they started using the IEDs more and more and more and we started learning how to deal with them and defeat them more and more but uh, there were still a lot of a lot of gunfights on my first tour a lot of gunfights think out of you know there, there's just a lot of fighting yeah I bet but yeah they really like their IEDs and their their suicide bombers and stuff like that so because you're a veteran I'm going to ask you this question um, just, just to get your take on it I think I've told Fred this story before so um Back back around uh, Halloween, um, I took I, I took uh, I, t- I took my little kids down to uh, Capitol Reef for a uh, camping uh, camping trip, and on the way back, um, we also stopped at Goblin Valley. It was a great camp out. Really enjoyed. Did you push over some of the goblins? Absolutely not, um, <laughs> because I'm not an idiot. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, um, so anyways, on the way back from Goblin Valley, we stop at a gas station in Price, and I get up to, you know, I, I take I take my eight-year-old daughter in with me, we're, we're going to the bathroom, and I see on the sign, masks preferred, not required, and so I think, okay, great, I go in there, um, you know, she goes into the women's room, I go into the men's room, I come out obviously a lot quicker than her, and uh, I'm having to just stand there in the hall next to the bathrooms, waiting and waiting. You know, a few people pass by. Everybody else is wearing masks and stuff. Well, at one point, this this guy looked looked like he was maybe 25 years old. You know, kind of slender. Walks up to me and says, "Did you forget your mask?" Kind of with a goofy uh, smile on his face. And I said, "Hell no." <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, uh, I don't forget it. I don't have and he him. starts get, he starts giving me the, starts giving me a lecture about uh, how there's a pandemic going on. I'm like, I don't give a crap. The sign, I'm healthy, and the sign says masks preferred, not required. Well, I prefer not to wear the mask. If you're worried about it, stay and then he says, place. and and I said, and besides, I'm free to choose. And he's like, well, I'm a vet, and I fought for your freedom. I think those um, veterans are pieces And at that shit. point, I'm just like, dude, just leave me alone. <laughs> and so I, I just want to hear your thought on... I would have told him he was such a piece of shit. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, great, you're a veteran, cool. You know what moral high ground you have? <laughs> Absolutely none. Yeah, thanks for your service. You went and did something hard. So have millions of other Americans. It gives you no superiority. Mm-hmm. It gives you no, you know, no right to say, I'm a veteran and I think you should wear a mask. Well, you're basically saying that everything that you fought and should stand for, you don't. You're a statist. Yeah. Good for you. You're a veteran and you believe in wearing masks. Don't be a freaking douchebag. You didn't fight for my freedom if you're telling me what to do. You fought for the government. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
They are not synonymous. Exactly. They're not synonymous. No, I would have told him he was a piece of shit and told him to pound sand and I don't know how many different ways. <laughs> yeah, I I just wanted out of the uh, conversation. I was I was kind of steaming hot mad about it, and so I just told him to get uh, get out of my face. For a lot of years, for a lot of years, I was really pretty quiet about being a veteran, but I've never used it as high ground for an argument other than you know they told us that this is what we what we were going to do. This is what we were fighting for, and it turns out that none of that was to be. None of that was true, and, you know, I don't know. I kind of have... Nobody really cares if you're a veteran, and nobody cares about your opinion anymore just because you're a vet veteran on most aspects. Here's, here's another question for you. Okay. When people come up to you in the store, you know, let, let's just say, let, let's just say it's obvious, let's say you, you were wearing, like, Let's say you were wearing camo or something, something that makes it obvious that you're you're a vet. Um, not that camo would, because I, I I wear camo too, but <laughs> and I've never been in the military. But um, what I'm I, I guess what I'm saying is um, when people come up to to soldiers and say thank you for your service, what's your feeling on that? Um, I think it's important to to thank people for their service. Um, it always, and it still does make me pretty uncomfortable. I really don't like it. Um, but, I, you know, I don't wear the veterans' hats and, and stuff like that. I, I wear a lot of patriotic and uh, veteran-owned apparel, stuff like that. But um, even when I was still in the military, I would avoid going places in my uniform because it made me uncomfortable. I didn't like it. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what I... That's kind of what I've, I was imagining, that most soldiers probably feel uncomfortable when people say that. Even if they're grateful that the person's grateful, it's just at the same time, it's like, you're making me feel awkward here. <laughs> and so I typically don't, yeah. unless I'm actually already in a conversation, and maybe I'll throw it in, oh, and by the way, thank you for your service. Well, maybe, maybe, <laughs> if it makes sense to say it. <laughs> um, the further you get... It's, it's at least for me. It's really it's really complicated. Um, it's a complicated type of emotion. Um, as far as as the veterans go, the guys who are wearing their Vietnam and Korea hats, I'll thank them for their service. And you know, sometimes I tell them that I was in and that I spent time in Iraq and whatnot. But um, there's. There's a whole, there's a lot that goes into it, especially when you start diving into the psychological aspect of having been overseas and having been in fights and and everything. But there's it just psychologically it gets very complicated and, and weird. Uh, I've got I've gotten used to a lot of things that are kind of not normal for veterans, <laughs> but um, because we just we came home and it was nowhere near as bad as the Vietnam veterans, but you know, came home, nobody really cared. And, you know, that's fine. But, uh, you know, you go and you do these terrible, awful things for, you know, for the country, and they use your patriotism against you and your love of the country against you and lie to you. And then you come home and nobody cares and you get called baby killer and blah, blah, blah. On the psychological aspect, you just ask these guys to go you know, far away and kill these people and do all this shit and that's why you look back throughout all of human history when your armies came home, there were the big parades the big, you know good job guys and stuff and that psychologically that's important because it reinforces to them that what they were doing, these terrible awful things were you know, necessary and worth it and everything like that and we don't do that anymore um and so our our new veterans, our new generations of veterans, have to get used to and adapt to that because our society has changed, and there's no longer honor and value in doing those things. Um, people view us as a pawn, which and it probably also we kind of are, yeah. but it probably also doesn't help when you have. Uh, you know, some wars that uh, there there are a lot of people who, and and I'm 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 kind of 
I'm kind of unsure, like, what to think. But, you know, with the Vietnam War and with the Iraq War, both of them were wars that... It's unclear arguments that you... have... It's unclear whether they were legitimate in terms of being started with good intent, um, you know, with... Or, or even with honest... Um, you know, an, an honest sales pitch by the politicians who started those wars. And it, and it makes you it makes you really question because it's like, okay, but I mean, the soldiers didn't choose that that was, you know, a policy. You know, the soldiers went and did what they were told and they did so valiantly. But the politicians, they lied about certain things. Like, for example, LBJ totally lied about the Gulf of Tonkin. So... Yeah, they have tendency to do that. <laughs> I mean... I, you know what? I don't know. Either. I'll be completely honest with you. I don't know either. I don't know how I feel about it. I know that they sent us to do a job, and then they wouldn't really let us do our job. And then... They... We left before, you know, anything was really done and established and so you just leave it to go back to the way it was and I really started coming around to it and everything when uh, when ISIS came back through Ramadi and the ISIS flag was flying in there stuff like that I'm like what was even the point you know, my friends died over there my brother died because he went over there and we just leave it and they you know it was all for nothing yeah. You know, but I mean, once you know, once you get over there and you're in all that shit, and we know that we can't trust the government <laughs> in the military, you know, because they'll hang you out to dry if you know bad stuff happens, which it's war and it does. But ultimately, what it becomes about is it's about your guys, you and your guys. You know, we'll lie for each other, we'll die for each other, kill for each other, and. Because we, we're just their pawns. Um, they promise the world to us, and be like, "Yeah, you're doing such a great thing." And then you get home, and you're busted up, you know, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And then you're just kind of left to your own devices. Well, good luck. Thanks for your service. And so, I don't know. It's a travesty. The entire situation is a travesty. We knew over there that we couldn't trust the government. We would have to lie about things, how they happened and what happened, so that people weren't going to jail because they put us in impossible situations. So, and that and that actually is one thing that I I did really like about Donald Trump is that he was the first president in like forty years to not start a new war. <laughs> it's like, isn't that crazy? I mean, the Republicans are warmongers. Well, you're both warmongers. Yes. <laughs> especially, especially Barack Obama. I mean, oh my goodness. Yeah, you know, he got us involved in a bunch of places. That dude's a piece of shit. Not to mention, he was killing civilians with drones. I mean, U.S. citizens. Yeah, and including U.S. citizens. Yeah, I mean, and I'm just like, seriously. And you gave him the freaking Nobel Peace Prize? <laughs> my my position on that, of killing American citizens with gun strikes, yeah, they're allowed their due process of law and everything like that. But my, I'm of the opinion that you decide to leave and go fight with another enemy force who's... You're basically giving up your oh, right yeah. to citizen. That's, no, I'm, I'm not, that's, that's my opinion of it. They, they just, are still entitled to the due process uh, of law, but... Yeah, I just think it's really suspect that, uh, you know, we, I mean, because a lot of this stuff, I mean, we, we, we really got to consider how much really stupid foreign policy has led to so many people hating on Americans. Yeah. Because, I mean, if we were literally just the people who lib liberated Europe from the Nazis, okay, great. We'd be heroes for a, for a century. But... Then we go in and do a bunch of really stupid stuff, uh, you know, like like overthrowing, you know, like overthrowing throwing the uh, Iranian government in the early 1950s, and you're just like, oh, okay, I get it, that was for oil, but 
um, you realize that came back to bite us really bad in 1979 and it's still biting us which here's an interesting thought come full circle today's the last day of the year 2020 what happened on the first day of 2020 they signed the uh, they signed a bill that uh, was against was this one on 2020 no, the first day of 2020, remember? World War Three. Oh, yeah. It lasted for... It, it was a meme war that lasted for about a day. But oh. it, it was it was because of the Iranian uh, the Iranian situation yeah, the, in uh, in Baghdad. Yeah. The, yeah. They were trying for another um, Benghazi. And within an hour, Trump had an, an additional 100 Marines flying over with Apaches and gunships and stuff saying, Yeah... Go ahead and try it. Yeah, not not to mention he killed Suleimani. Yeah. Yeah, which... Bye! I was like, okay, so you, you've been the instigator for a bunch of terrorist attacks for decades? Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah, he's killed a lot of, He was responsible for killing a lot of innocent people. Yeah, and responsible Ura- for a lot of Iranian, American deaths. Uh, <laughs> that and the Iranian government shot down the uh, that Ukrainian uh, passenger jet. Yeah, then Trudeau blamed Trump. Bunch of our citizens are dead because of you. Who? No. Who? 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 Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. I know him as uh, Prime Minister Blackface. <laughs> 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 yeah. This is your fault. What? Yeah. Trump forgot to switch off Iran's AA missiles. You're freaking moron. Sure, Justin. Sure, Justin. Why How about you, you go post topless for a, for a women's nudie magazine again, and and just and just continue to be uh, you know continue your military exercises with the Chinese. Yeah, we've been watching that all year. Uh huh. Get. Yeah. Did he post topless for a women's nude magazine? I, th- I think so. Well, it was probably for dudes because he's a faggot. <laughs> I don't. I, I mean, he is married and has kids, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything anymore. It's all kind of uh, so is Fred. <laughs> and I've known Fred for a long time. <laughs> are, are are you coming out? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Dave, I'm glad you could experience this with us. I'm like <laughs> I'm one of those angry faggots like uh what's his name? On Boondock Saints. <laughs> oh, I, I haven't seen that movie. What? I've not seen it either. Freaking commies. Um, what's his What's his name? Played the green bad guy in Spider Man. The green. Willem Dafoe. Yeah, he was gay in that movie. And he was really angry about it. It's pretty funny. <laughs> okay. You should watch it, but not when your kids are around. Do you want some now, Dave? I uh, know I'm good. Well, I'm not. I'm not much. I'm not. You're much. a gracious guest. I'm not. I'm not much one for uh, hot drinks. Even you know, even hot chocolate on a on a really cold day, I still prefer cold water. Uh, I don't know. It's just, but I like to be cold. I like I like being up in the mountains. I'd much snow. rather be cold than hot. Hands down. Do you wear a lot of wool? Nah. <laughs> we're the synthetics people. We're worse, warmer. Or worse, better. Yeah, until it's wet. This is true. No, no, I just—I have a fetish with wool. <laughs> I have nothing against wool. I just—it's—it's it's expensive, and the synthetic that stuff is, is. Uh, the synthetic stuff's more affordable and works a lot better on the ski slopes. <laughs> just gotta layer, layer appropriately. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, I'm a big fan of wool. We talked about that. You've heard us talk about it. Wool is a good material. I love wool. I'm wearing wool socks right now. I love them. The last thing I, I would want to wear, though, is cotton socks. Cotton socks are horrible. Um, I, I'm, I'm amazed cotton, that people like cotton, cotton so socks. so super soft and so nice and comfortable and everything like that. But as soon as you sweat a just a... trap. I mean, you sweat just a little bit, and that cotton turns into a sopping rag. Mm. I hate cotton for that. I have... I am curious. I need to do the... I need to do some research, but like with your synthetics, like your Under Armour and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and how well does it retain its heating properties if it gets wet? 
Yeah. Do you know? It really I, depends I on the material. Yeah. And so you, you just have to study up which which uh, different materials because there's so many different blends. The one, the I, I'd say the one thing that's kind of common to all of them is polyester. Uh huh. But then the other materials that get mixed in. Spandex. Um, there. Well, some of them have spandex. Some of them have elastane. Some of them have polyurethane. Um, it's amazing how many different types of materials are in there, and the and the really amazing thing is, they're all made from oil, and and I can't help but thinking, huh, I really don't want to be in a fire with this. <laughs> yeah, they have, yeah, that's a really good point that I've never made about about that. <laughs> Although you know, even even those things, they're you know they say, uh, it's flame resistant. Yeah, but when it does catch on fire, it just freaking melts and drips on everything. Uh -huh. That's yeah. not what I want to get to my skin when that happens. Yeah, and, and in that regard, wool is a much better material. However, it is still flammable. Well, everything's flammable. You can burn everything. Hmm. You get hot, get it hot enough, it'll melt. Or burn. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, steel melts, yeah. Steel, rocks. Mm hmm. Very small rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Churches, lead. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> so <it works>. A duck. <laughs> Build a bridge out of it. <laughs> and for the audience. <laughs> Wait. Yeah, that's me. Never mind. I already know the reference. <laughs> <laughs> Sit there. Watch the podcast. Man, these guys are funny. <laughs> Um, what I was gonna say though is I, I will say this I am I am gonna comment on this YouTube video and I'm gonna comment very favorably <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I will like and share <laughs> the, as should you smash that like button yeah <laughs> 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 Give me more. Give me. Give me more energy. Nope. I don't have that. Say okay. smash. Smash that like button. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. You okay, man? You okay, bitch? <laughs> say smash that like. No, Fred. I'm not gonna say smash that like did button. I, did I? I think I posted that on one you, of the videos. You, you put that on several of the videos. Yeah, good. <laughs> That video that I took of you? Yeah, he, he, he's, he's clipped that and included it at the beginning of several of the videos. <laughs> oh, good. I, I always forget which ones I use, but I'm glad I've used that one. We need to record some more. I know. I know. So there's variety yeah. for Dave when he watches. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, on the bright side, though, you know, I mean. Sometimes least... I turn them on and I never get more than like two minutes past them. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, that's what we talked about on this one. <laughs> You know, on the bright side, my videos, I mean, I do have some variety. Sometimes I'm wearing a sweater. Sometimes I'm wearing a hoodie. Mm-hmm. But it's always from the driver's seat of my car while driving, huh? Well, we started moving around for the first, I don't know, 10 episodes. We'd move around to a different spot. Then I got sick of thinking of somewhere to go, so we started coming here. Now, this is a pretty nice spot. Yeah, I like and then, it. In the mornings when it's not super, super foggy like it is now, sometimes the sun will come up and it's nice. It goes up right through there. Mm. Although usually the sun at your back is bad for lighting Well, on it's a not going to be in my face. <laughs> I hate the sun. <laughs> although, <laughs> all, 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 although with this crowd, you know, maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> we look our best in the dark. I've seen <laughs> There's a lot of backlighting. You can't see your face. I've yeah, said, it's that, intentional. That was, that was intentional. <laughs> I've said it before. I have neither the face for TV or the voice for radio. Well, uh, you, you've heard my podcast. You know how nasally my voice is. It's <laughs> it's, it's horrifying. Same. <laughs> Uh, it's funny because you know I've I've tried to practice speaking with more resonance and and lose the uh, lose the nasal. I no, the nasal's still there, no matter how hard I try. They've got oh, a for sound. I don't probably. I don't hear it talking to you. 
And then when I when I talk, I don't hear my voice sounding nasally, but when I listen to it, I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's like when you listen to it, yeah, it, it's usually when I listen to it myself on, you know, like... Oh, listen recording. to this, nerd. It's like, ugh, ugh, does I sound that bad? Is that what people hear when I talk? <laughs> it's like it's like when I sing, it's like I always think I, I'm sounding so beautiful. Angelic. Like, and then, like, I hear a recording of myself singing, and I'm like, <gasps> let's turn this off. Not me. <laughs> I know that I sound like garbage when I sing. <laughs> They're like, yeah, this is awful. And not in a good way. <laughs> it's awful, not even in a cringeworthy, funny way. <laughs> Which was quite sad. Oh, man. I like fire. Yeah, and by the way, this is the coolest fire pit. I, I love this fire bowl. I don't like it because it does this really loud. And I'm always playing with the fire, knocking off knocking off the wood so it'll burn more. And it was always so noisy. It's always so noisy. My parents gave this to me for Christmas, and I didn't open it for like a year. And then finally we started doing these podcasts, and I opened it. Yeah, and you wanted to use it in August. I'm like, oh, I'm not okay with that. <laughs> We're doing them at night. It's still hot as. <laughs> it's still hot at night in the summertime, and I hate, I hate the heat. I hate bright lights, and I'm a welder. Go figure. <laughs> so what you're saying is you want to move to the Philippines? <laughs> nope. I hate humidity. I hate. I hate the hot. To be I want fair, to go live you hate in pretty much everything. No, I don't hate trees and r- lakes and rivers, and. In mountains. And Christmas. At Christmas. I love Christmas. There's a lot of things that I am not a fan of. That's a good point. That is a good point. But like, we live in a desert, and I'm okay with the desert right now. Mm-hmm. Although in July and August, it sucks. It's a bunch of bullshit <laughs> in July and August. I mean, the rest of the year, I love Utah. But in July and August, man, I hate it. <laughs> I stopped liking Utah in about June. <laughs> and then it's I usually don't... sometime around mid to late June. I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Usually... Right after that, la- that that last freak spring sto- snowstorm in yeah. early June, yeah. <laughs> and then I don't. I love those er- those late freak uh, snowstorms. Oh man, those are awesome. <laughs> and then I don't start liking Utah again until at least mid September, depending on the year. Sometimes October. But like, so out here where I live, there's usually a wind. And so even during the summertime, I'll still spend quite a bit of time outside. We go lay in my hammock or sit in my chair underneath the tree in the shade and do whatever. Mm-hmm. This year, 2020, was just so crappy all the way around. I mean, there wasn't even any wind, hardly. There wasn't even hardly a breeze out here. And I'm like, this is bullshit. I'm not going outside to sit in the heat without a breeze. I'll die. <laughs> I will straight up die. And then people are like, well, you spent, you spent how long, how long in Iraq? I'm like, yeah, two and a half years, and it gets up to 140 degrees. What's your point? The mm-hmm. hot sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you should be used to it. No, to hell with that. That's the stupidest thing you've ever said. <laughs> the irony is, in July, we we went down, we went down to St. George for uh, for a few days for vacation. It was it was 115 degrees every day, and I I hated that part of the trip, but you know. It was still better than being cooped up in the house. <laughs> no, there's AC at the house. Well, no. But I if mean, you live in town. No, we went into Zion. If and, you live in town, I can see that. I can see that. You know, any chance to go into Zion National Park is always a happy time for me. I've never uh, been to Zion. I mean. I always go that way to go on vacation. Although, if you want a really great national park, and I, I can tell this secret because, you know. I am the audience. We've got <laughs> low exposure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Capitol Reef National Park. I love that place. There's hardly yeah. anybody there. Yeah. Hardly anybody there. It's south. I it's know. South. Everything about south sucks. Oh, okay, but see, here's the thing. You stay at the Fruita Campground. No. The Fruita Campground is no. a fruit orchard where you can pick the fruit off the trees. And it's right next to a river no. that cools the cools the orchard. 
And so, and it's nestled in nope. between high rocks, so it's nope. in shade the whole time. So it's nope. actually really quite pleasant. Nope, it's south. I don't go south unless I absolutely have to. <laughs> Any time of year. So in, in February, when we get our tax return, we usually take the kids. You get a tax return? Yeah, I have kids. <laughs> I'm not super rich like you guys. So just leave me alone, okay? <laughs> Now, when we get our taxes back um, in February, we'll usually take the kids up to Idaho Falls just so they can stay in a hotel and go swim in the pool and stuff like that. Because we realized a couple of years ago, yeah, we go on vacation every year. We don't ever stay in a hotel. My, so my kids never stayed in a hotel before. I'm like, oh, we should probably take them. Because it's fun as a kid to go stay in a hotel. As an adult, it sucks because it's not yeah. your bed. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they never have the right pillows. No, their pillows always suck. So and I we, always forget to bring my own pillow. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. But we started... Nice little neurotic aside there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we started taking our kids up to Idaho Falls to go to the Museum of Idaho up there and stay in a stay in a hotel in February so the kids, like I said, can stay in a hotel and swim and play and stuff like that. I don't know that we're going to be able to do it this year. I don't know that the museum's open. I don't know if you can use the pool. No, I can't swim in a mask. I can't breathe in a mask when it's dry. So I and I feel bad about that. I don't even know if we'll be able to go. So, um, so my wife and I we just uh, we just went on a uh, trip to Brian Head for our 20th anniversary. We stayed at the Best Western there in Brian Head. 20th? City. Yeah. How old are you? <laughs> I don't know. Pretty young. I thought you were my age. I think you're a lot older than I am. I don't know. I don't know how old you are. I don't. I'm 35. I'll be 35. Yeah, I don't typically month. ask other men like what their age is because I don't give a crap. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm curious to see how old you are. I because I like to give people crap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my 40s. Wow, you're pretty much at the end of your rope. <laughs> I've got a daughter. In, I've got a daughter in college, so yeah. But uh, yeah, so now anyways, I've reached the age where people are start or the younger kids at work are starting to call me old. <laughs> I'll beat your ass. Like, you can't even freaking walk. You're not gonna beat my ass. <laughs> yeah, but I can either a sneak up on you eventually, or b hide and then pounce. So, anyways, my point was that the Best Western, the the policy was you had to wear the mask into the pool, into the pool area. When you get into the water, you can take off the mask, but then as soon as you get out of the water, you have to put the mask back on. We just didn't wear them at all. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know if places even the had their The funny thing is, like, nobody open. in the hotel, nobody in the hotel was wearing the mask except when they were in the lobby in front of the front desk. The front, you know, the, the, the concierges at the front mm -hmm. desk, they were wearing their masks. And in, and anytime anybody was walking through the lobby, they'd throw the mask on, take it back off <laughs> as soon as they got out of the lobby. Because nobody freaking cared. It was just like, we, we got this little virtue signal. Okay, yeah, let's... let's I let's, care. I <laughs> care about my family. I don't care about my family. <laughs> so, yeah. And the funny, this, the funny thing is, they actually had the fitness room closed. Due to COVID, it was completely empty, and and I asked I asked one of the uh, I asked one of the attendants in the uh, hotel, I'm just like, wait, the uh, the fitness room's closed? They're like, don't worry about it, it's unlocked. Just go in there and 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 don't make a big fuss about it. <laughs> so I, I do, <laughs> I hop on the treadmill, get some, get a workout, and uh, of course you know. It was a really crappy workout because, you know, it's like at 10,000 feet there at the base of the mountain. So, um, <laughs> I'm like puffing and puffing like crazy. So do you like, wear a you know, mask there? How much oxygen do you actually get? <laughs> oh, I'm, yeah. a I'm a mountain people. I can't wear a mask. There's no <laughs> oxygen I'm, here. I, see, see, I'm fine hiking up to 14,000 feet. No problem. But, man... Trying to run at 10,000 feet? I suck at that. Well, running was never my strong suit, even before I was crippled, and now I can't do it, so... I, you know what? That's I'm okay with that. Running sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always been 
you know, a big guy. I've got big shoulders. Uh huh. Pretty <laughs> shoulders, you know. right? It's the shoulders. No, hey, it's all the shoulders. I've always had broad shoulders, Fred. Mm. Well, I'm trying to go back like a hundred pounds ago. <laughs> Okay, so not 100 pounds ago, because I graduated. But, so 40 pounds ago. 40, 50 pounds ago. Because um, I graduated high school at 225. Were you that big? Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. wow. I graduated high I school at 225. Small. I was 135 when I graduated. Small? You yeah. remember me being small? Come to think you of it, I'm, I'm when thinking... When I graduated high school, I was about 135. <laughs> yeah, I was too And then high. I boomed up to like 200 uh, when I was at the MTC, ready, uh, ready going to the, on the mission. Wow. And then dropped back down to 150 about uh, three months into my mission in the Philippines. <laughs> See, and right now, I, right now I weigh 265, 270. So, you know, a few, a few cheeseburgers ago. <laughs> Um, I used, when I was in, when I was in shape and I was, you know, younger, I could run a six minute mile, you know, six thirty mile, which is pretty impressive for a guy who's short and freaking just a yeah, fridge. That, yeah, that's, that's actually really good for a stocky person. But then you. I broke my ankle and I haven't been able to run ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so, but even then, even when I was in shape, I hated running. People like me aren't meant to be runners. You want this mountain moved or all these big old slabs of concrete? Give us enough time, we'll do it. But run? Pfft, no. No. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're made for. Spiking we dwarves world. are natural sprinters. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when you bring in Star Wars. Star Wars Rings. <laughs> That's the other, the other greatest documentary ever made. <laughs> I love when people say that it's that it's made And I up. love how you provoke them on purpose that way. <laughs> Who's going to go out of their way to make to make something like that up? Really? I mean, come on. Not to mention all the video proof. Video evidence. It's called fiction, which is uh, starts out mostly fact. <laughs> and then I don't know what the sh I don't know what all the eyes and the shin mean. Just do it to below the knee. <laughs> it's by the dwarfs. Uh, yeah, fiction. It's almost fact. I don't know. In, in the year 2020, I think that's very true. <laughs> in fact, fact seems stranger than fiction this year. <laughs> you know what? I know a lot of people have had a pretty rough year. It's been pretty bad for some people. But for me, it really hasn't been that bad. Me neither. Either, yeah. Other than, like, I've had a lot of <clears throat> issues with my body this year, but, you know, outside of that, it really hasn't been that bad of a year for me, other than people like, sir, where's your mask? <laughs> uh, I don't have one. Did you forget your mask? Nope. I don't got one. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the funny thing, is, like, this has actually been one of the best years of my life. Excuse Same. me, sir, where's your mask? Uh, I don't negotiate with terrorists. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see that, I mean, this is a total, totally shitty year for the whole world as a whole. What's really shitty about it is but it's so for fabricated. For me and my family, this has been one of the best years ever. Yeah. It's, it's so funny how that can be. We've had a pretty good year. And it, it, it kind of goes back to, you know, you know, to circle back to religion and, and like, you know, Christianity following, following the Savior Jesus Christ. And it's like, it's amazing how you can have peace and happiness and prosperity with even though the rest of the world is going to hell yeah but if you if you follow the lord even if you're i mean and you could be also going through hell yourself mm -hmm. but you can still have that peace and happiness and spiritual yeah. prosperity and that's what's really cool about it yeah. see for like for me personally i think as a country we're about to head down a pretty dark um, miserable path. Would you say it's a like while. a dark winter? <laughs> yes. I don't understand that reference, but I'm going to say yes. <laughs> Joe Biden said that during the uh, debate. Joe Biden can't even spell his own name. <laughs> he also said that they put together the greatest uh, voting fraud. Or, uh, yeah, the, yeah, he did. He did. he did actually say they created the the greatest <laughs> voting fraud organization ever. Hey, so that was fact check. They was he misspoke. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> the fact check makes it worse at that point. It's like, they, it was a Freudian wait, wait, slip. Was that, political, <laughs> was that PolitiFact USA Today? Which which fact check organization was it? The Facebook one. Yeah, whichever one. Uh, whichever. You're not fact checking anything. You're just controlling the flow of information. I'm smart enough to see through your lies. And the, and the irony is when you see those fact check labels, I usually go, oh, this that must means be it, true. Let's look that into this. It yeah. might be true. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man! This has been fact checked independently. Or independently, you mean by like the people that you pay? You mean like a twenty-two-year-old college, uh, you know, recent college grad who's working for like twelve bucks an hour, <laughs> and he's just told, "Hey, yeah, tell you say that this is this is false." I mean, no offense to twenty-two-year-olds, but you know. Oh yeah, I do. <laughs> you no, know, I used to think that I had my shit together when I was twenty-two and as a teenager. You always. You always think that, you know, you've got the world figured out. No. No, The more exactly. I look back at my early 20s, well, mo my early 20s, I was... I spent, was a moron in my young 20s. I, I, spent my, <laughs> I spent my early 20s overseas, so... So, yeah, I did a lot of stupid shit, but... I mean, young... I mean, youth is definitely wasted on the young. Oh, yeah. I mean... <laughs> oh, yeah. And well, I can say that as, old, as an old man now. <laughs> super old. <laughs> I know. Super old. Like, I'm surprised you haven't, like, just... I'm Girl. glad I let you borrow my good chair. Your hip would be out by now. <laughs> you realize I can still outrun you. <laughs> That's fine. I'll just, I can shoot. I can hit pretty much whatever I want to, so. Just saying. Mental note, don't cross me. <laughs> you know, I started watching Duck Dynasty again the other day. I'm watching it. I'm listening to Uncle Cy. And watching all the shit things that he says. So, so like, oh my gosh. That's going to be me. Pretty soon, single-handedly, I will have fought the entire Iraq war. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, cut. <laughs> so, that's one of those shows that I'm so sad that there's not more like it. And it started out great. The first couple of seasons are awesome. And then they just started trying too hard. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so it wasn't funny, but the things that I really liked about it is at the end of each episode, they're together as a family, Phil prays, and, you know, it's just good, wholesome entertainment, and that's one thing that our society is really lacking. I love seeing it. I love seeing it at the end of each episode, them being together as a family, and they're so thankful for what they have, for the simple things that they have, like the, you know, being able to provide... The, the food on the table and stuff like that. And that's what Phil's always praying about is he's thankful for, you know, the the, the things that the woods and the, the, the waters provide and stuff. And I think it's very, it's very simple. And it's very, it's so much easier to be happy and at peace when you're just grateful for the simple things that you have. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had this conversation with one of the guys that I, that I worked with yesterday. Um, the, because there's, we I work with a lot of kind of whiny people. And they'll, well, they'll you mentioned whine. you you mentioned the young people, so that makes sense. No, it's not the young people; it's the older guys. Oh, really? Yeah, it's the people you and up. <laughs> oh, oh, this is bullshit. We got to work all these They're hours. They're probably blah, baby boomers. Blah, blah, blah. Yes, they are. <laughs> we'll just sit there and they'll just bitch to be about clear. Everything. I'm That's a Gen good. Xer. <laughs> You're still old. I know. So anyway. So I was talking with my lead man yesterday at lunch, and, and I'm like, you know, we actually work for a really good company. They take really good care of us. Yeah, they work their guts out. They pay us more than fair, because comparatively to do what I do, I probably make about half what I make. And so we were just talking about it. I'm like, you know what the problem is? is people just, especially just in our society in general, we need to be... We get focused on the things that we don't have. All the niceties and, you know, the the super cool cars, all the toys, new houses. We, we get preoccupied with that and think about how bad we have it and how picked on we are. And, you know, that negativity, is it's a cancer. It spreads. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we could really just all be more grateful... For the simple things that we have, we'd be so much better off. Don't do that again. <coughs> but 
No, it, you know, the, they did that give thanks thing around Thanksgiving time. Mm-hmm. I didn't do it, but... <laughs> but, you know, I, we really just... We need to be more grateful for what we do have because, yeah, we're not ever... Most of us aren't going to have everything we want. But that's fine. You, see, you know, I don't know. We just need to be more grateful and thankful for what we have. And we'll be a lot happier. To me, it's interesting how our perspective of life is so much affected by the way that our mind chooses to think about things. And that gratitude, it brings that to your, it brings that to your actual attention. That brings the goodness into life. And it like, it really does change the experience you have in life, you know? Yeah, but who chooses our, our, uh, how we feel about things? What, what determines if we're grateful for what we have versus, you know, what we don't have? Exactly. We do. We do. You know, I drive, uh... 22-year-old truck. It's got 270,000 miles on it. I could go buy a new one today if I wanted to. But, you know what? I'm pretty happy and I'm pretty content with it. Mm-hmm. Starts up, goes where I want to. The heater kind of sucks, but... But, but you wear wool, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that it's a superior warmth product. There Just remember, people, buy wool. <laughs> buy wool. Um, you know, I... I'm very content. Of course, with Mitch has been bought off by Big Wool. <laughs> I don't even know who that would be. <laughs> I don't know. The sheep herders? <laughs> the... No, I don't think it's going to be them. They don't make crap. <laughs> we should split this log for that. I've got to beat the shit out of it. It's a little burn. Oh, well, I give up. Just let it burn. It won't. It's got too much charcoal on it. Mm. <laughs> D-bag sometimes. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> you know, why are you such an angry person, Mitch? <laughs> if you were grateful, you'd be less angry. <laughs> you know what? You're right, Fred. You're right. You're still a douchebag, though. And that's okay. <laughs> I kind of respect you. <laughs> But not too much. <laughs> no, because that would be queer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you, but not like that. <laughs> Get away from me. <laughs> no, no, yeah. I was, I was, I was putting up that video the, for the last a few weeks ago, and there was something about you, we said. I was talking about wood or something like that. I was like, that. oh, it was that log, that piece of wood that was really nice that you brought out, remember? And I was like, oh, that's a good piece of wood and stuff. And you said something in the effect of like... Thank you. Yeah, you're like, thank you. And I started laughing and my wife's like, what are you laughing about? And I had to explain that... It's a penis joke. Yeah, I, I explained that wood was a reference to like an erect penis. And it was just, she's like, what the... What is wrong with you people? All of it. <laughs> Uh, that's what I always say when people say, what is wrong with you? All of it. <laughs> Everything. It was, it was, it was funny because like, I love it when I have to explain things that you, that, uh, especially la- language nuance. Foreigners. That's, that's that, that like, it makes me actually realize like, this is why you're laughing. And it's like, oh, that's pretty dirty. You shouldn't be laughing at that. But it's like, dude, penis tw- jokes are funny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm so happy. <laughs> Simple mind. Hi, uh, bitches, Bob. Come on. <laughs> I know you're super proud. She should I, be. I would be. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> no, she did. She, she told me, she's like, I wish you guys would be more professional. I said, no. <laughs> you are talking to the wrong guy. Professionals for work. And it it makes my mom so mad. She's like, you know what? You can be so professional, so well-spoken, and so charming, but you just choose not to be, and it is so frustrating for me to see that. It's not worth my time. It's so much easier. so much more gratifying to just be who I really am. Oh, man. And that's that's a weird thought, too, you know, because, you know, being, being parents ourselves, you know, it's like, are we going to end up being disappointed in our kids? 
And I think the answer is yes. Well, I'm a disappointment, so. I mean, because I, I know, I, I know I'm disappointing to my parents in some ways. I mean, I'm sure they're thrilled about other aspects of me, but, you know, but disappointed for the most part. <laughs> I'm the only one of my siblings that is in a trade. The rest of my siblings have an education. Well, except for Tyler. He's dead, so he gets out of it easy. He's got the perfect excuse. But, uh, yeah, my sister's going to college. My brother, my brother that's just older than me, he is a manager here for a pretty big company locally. <clears throat> so, you know, he's done really good. He's been pretty blessed. My brother does something with computers for Intermountain Healthcare. And so, you know, I've got all these professionals in my family, and then there's me who throws gloves at my coworkers and calls them faggots all day. <laughs> Isn't it funny? It chases my little light. Isn't it funny, though, how, how the language is so corrupted in that way that you actually refer to, you know, you being a tradesman and the others being educated as though that's like a step down? Even though... Yeah, 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 yeah. Even though, here's the thing. I've known way too many moronic PhDs <laughs> to believe that education has anything to do with intelligence. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, after all, I have a freaking master's degree, and I'm a freaking idiot. <laughs> so, I mean... <laughs> That's why I said professional jobs as opposed to trade. Yeah, exactly. You know? and, so, and, my job is equally and the as thing important that I found, as what their jobs are, because the, I build... I help build the infrastructure for the for our country. Yeah, because, I mean, I, I look at it, it's like, okay, yeah, as an architect, I, I deal with tradespeople a lot. And I'll, t I'll tell you, every time... You're so time, lucky. I'll tell you, every time I deal with tradespeople, I'm like, man, this is a smart person, because they're they may not they might not have like the book smarts. Yeah, we don't. But it's like they're yeah. they're like they they actually know what they're doing. We they, don't. They we know, know how, how to, to build. They we know, know how, how to, to translate a concept into an actual physical reality, mm -hmm. which is in, requires I'll, a high degree of intelligence and dexterity to be yeah. able to do that. I can I can draw the pictures of what to what to build all day long, but if you've ever seen any of the drywall that I've done, <laughs> it looks like shit. <laughs> I I mean like I suck at actually building things. I know how to design a building. That's why they have contractors. I, but that exactly, and that's what I tell people is like, look, you you've got different rules for a reason, and stop crapping on the on the tradespeople. Just because they didn't go to college. Because you know, we don't like, have that fancy paper. That fancy piece of paper is worthless when it comes right down to it. If it's not yeah. for the actual job that you're doing, the actual competency that you bring to a job, all the paper does is say, yeah, I have the tenacity to, I can, I have the tenacity I to go and regurgitate me. information in fast tests for four years at a university and spend insane amounts yeah. of money to for that privilege <laughs> you know that that's yeah. really all that's saying and and granted there's some professions where you absolutely have to do it you know to even be able to get the license in that profession so take for example architecture medicine law accountants stuff like that okay yeah you need you need that college degree so that you can even qualify for that job yeah, but, but it, there's but so there's, there's so lots few... of college majors that are so completely useless. Mm -hmm. Well, no, there's also there's not very many jobs that you can just teach somebody how to do, even at the professional level. Mm -hmm. Most people can be taught to do just about anything. So, but do they have papers but, saying that? <laughs> so I got in, a, in an <laughs> argument with my with my brother and my sister in law a couple of years ago, and uh, they were talking about. Uh, how somebody, how somebody had more of an education than somebody else, something like that, and so they were talking about how stupid the other person was. I said, you know, education and intelligence are not the same thing. And they looked at me like I was <laughs> retarded. He's like, okay, let's uh, let's go get lost out in the woods and we'll see who survives for a week. <laughs> you know, it's just an education and intelligence—they're not the same thing. Yeah. Because you can be taught. Like your education, they teach you, you know, like your um, theories and everything like that. Um, I don't know. Well, it's kind of like the IQ. You know, I'm not, I, I'm IQ not good is totally at... a phony thing. Um, intelligence quotient, I mean, all that is is 
showing how good you are at taking tests. I mean, that, that doesn't really show anything about your actual intelligence. And so when people, you know, if anybody ever actually tries to advertise, oh, well, I have an IQ of 135, and it's like, so what? I mean, that doesn't mean what can anything. You make? What do you actually know? Yeah, I mean, okay, so great, you're good at taking tests. That doesn't mean that you actually have a skill that can help you survive. Um, because nobody's paying you to take tests. Well, that's just not true. I mean, unless you work for a testing company and you're <laughs> testing the new test to make sure that it's a good test. Man, they should, oh, that's what I should do for a living. But that's, but that's like video game testers. I mean, getting paid to play a video game to test it before it goes out. Okay, sure. You know, yeah, I like playing video games, but I don't like them that much. It actually sounds like it would not be a very gratifying job. No, it would get boring after a while. Especially with it as crappy as a lot of video games have gotten over time. Yeah, tell me about it. I've been trying... I bought the... I've been playing Call video of, games since the 80s. Call of Duty Modern Warfare you, last year. They I haven't gotten haven't any better. It. Graphically, stunning. Yes. Visually, the games are getting really amazing with how good they look. Yeah, but are any of them Choplifter or Double Dragon? <laughs> I don't know either of those games. That's because you're a tool. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think that that was a very nice thing to say. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Are you going to go oh, tell his mom? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways. Hey, hey. There's nothing in there. Uh -huh. but, yeah, but that sucks my, to suck, huh? That's my point. It's like, oh, okay, so take, take for example, the games. Uh, take a couple of my favorite games, Civilization and SimCity. Okay? I used to love playing SimCity. Uh, hey, I'm an architect, okay? Yeah. What, do you, what do you think I played as a kid? I was, I was playing city building games. Leave me alone. <laughs> All I'm saying is, like, the, the SimCity was a great game, and then... It wasn't. Like, as new versions of the game came out, graphically it got better, but the quality of the gameplay actually became really crappy. And same thing with Civilization. The The best version of Civilization is Civ Five. When they went to Civ Six, it sucks! Red. It's too hot. And did I just go off onto a tangent that's, like, completely useless? I don't yeah, know, probably. probably. <laughs> that's what we do. We're talking a lot of lots of stupid shit. You're in good company. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'll still watch. That's probably why you're the only audience member. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's a, it's a long drive, man. <laughs> it's it's more than fifteen miles. <laughs> <laughs> that seriously blew me away. I was blown away by that. You you guys drove all the way out there. I'm like, yeah, it's only fifteen miles. It's not like driving to Salt Lake. Oh, how long did it take you to get there? Well, gee, traffic sucks around here. For 30, 45 minutes, something like that. <sighs> yeah, the concept of distance is very relative, I've decided. No, I, I, and, I, and I, liked, I liked when you talked about Mount Vernon on, a, on that episode, because uh, that, that is such a cool there? place. Yes. Dude. No, I. It is a place that every American should go visit. Other than going to Arlington, um, that was my absolute. Ar Arlington's one of those that's places. That's what where I'm going to do. Arlington's one of those places that yes, go to the Arlington Cemetery. It is a very moving experience, but the education that you get when you go to Mount Vernon is so valuable. Um, mm -hmm. It is because you get to learn a lot more about who. Um, George Washington truly was yeah. as a person. I mean, he. I mean, a lot of people criticize him for having slaves, but he treated his slaves as family. Mm. I mean, he literally treated them as though they were his own family, and actually granted to them land upon his death, along with their freedom. Well, they don't tell that at school. I know. No, but it's it's the truth. He actually granted land. By the way, a lot of people, a lot of people don't realize this about George Washington. He actually married into the money. Martha mm -hmm. was actually the rich one. <laughs> well, he wasn't. 
It wasn't I wouldn't that say he was. It, it wasn't he, that wasn't, he wasn't rich. No, it's not that he wasn't. He wasn't poor. Yeah, I mean, when he married Martha, but he, I mean, he wasn't. He wasn't as rich as he was about to be. <laughs> but Martha you know? was part of the Fairfax clan. Yeah, I mean, they were extremely wealthy, and. So oh, and when George he just he had a mind for business and how to make money, and that's why by the end of the Revolutionary War, he was one of the richest men in America, uh, if not the richest man in America. Yeah, I think Ben Franklin might have been slightly richer. I'm not sure. I yeah, I don't know. I don't both, know who both was of them richest, are were, they were extraordinarily rich. Well, uh, he ben made Franklin a lot of, was amazing. He too. made a lot of great land speculations. Washington did. He had a, a mind for that, mm -hmm. for land, and and he was also a, a amateur architect. He was, uh, he was also an amateur. Well. He was an amateur lawyer. Um, well, he helped write the law, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I say amateur as in he he didn't have professional training in it. Same thing with Thomas yeah. Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson may have been a professional lawyer, but he was an amateur architect. He he trained himself, mm -hmm. which you could do back then. Well, they had to. Yeah. In fact, the first licensed, the first professionally trained architect in America was Lunfant, who designed uh, the city Is of Washington, D.C. And he was French. Gross. He was professionally trained in France because there were no architecture schools in America at the time of the Revolution. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a fascinating thing to see how we've gone from everybody... And just pull up by your bootstraps and figure it out. Do it yourself. Mm -hmm. To where, oh, well, trained. you need a piece of paper. Yeah. yeah. Well, George Washington wanted to go to college when he was younger. He wanted to be, you know, that, that well, he wanted that good education. But and he, he, but he, he never got had, sucked in by the he, army recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> but he never had that opportunity to go and, and study abroad and stuff like that, which he always, um, you know, regretted, but... He's still a really smart guy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All brilliant. those guys were. The fact that as a teenager, George Washington actually wrote a wrote his own rule book for how to properly behave as a gentleman. I mean, that's that's pretty impressive. I mean, like how many teenagers do you know that are thinking, "Hey, how should the how should I be, how should I behave for a, a success?" Shit, I'm 35 years life. old. And I don't do that. I mean. When I was a teenager, I was smoking dope. I wasn't thinking about how to, like, you know, figure out how to be successful in life. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the, the, George Washington was a—he was a brilliant man. Mm -hmm. But no, I yeah, out of out of everything that we did, I mean, um, Arlington was cool. It was very, very neat, humbling experience. But I think out of that entire trip of being back there for just a few days. The thing that was most profound was going to Mount Vernon because for me it was just as it was just as spiritual an experience as it was anything else for me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, I already knew a lot of the stories and everything about George Washington that they tell there when I got there, but seeing him presented in the way that they, they did the museum it just really made made it resonate more. It was so neat. He also invented fake stone cladding. Really? Yeah, Mount Vernon. That's that's actually wood siding made to look oh, like yep, stone. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I remember that now. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I, oh, I forgot about that. Which means yeah. he is more American than anybody. <laughs> what is more American than putting up fake stone to make a house look more rich than it actually is? <laughs> I forgot about that, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Because they, that's what they tell you when you first go on the tour. Yeah, this is actually wood. It's like, huh, I wouldn't have looked at it close enough to know the difference. <laughs> yep. Oh my gosh, it was just such a neat experience to go to Mount Vernon. If you ever had the chance, go. Yeah, absolutely. And the the other cool thing is his his tomb is actually on the on the premises. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a longer walk. Uh, you go you go down the hill a bit uh, by anywhere. the river, but. The, to be able to take a moment and be at his tomb and just contemplate what value his life brought to this world. I mean, he literally changed the world for for better just by the force of 
him being a good person trying to bring about freedom. A good, honest man. Mm hmm The entire thing would have fallen apart without him. Absolutely. And, yeah, so, I mean, they, the whole thing about society now and, and everything is discrediting these founders because... They had slaves, and well, they have. And they to don't like what how they can you, stand for. If anymore. you're gonna, if you're gonna win with your communist revolution, you have to discredit the his, the history of the place. So it, they did mm -hmm. this in Russia with the. Uh, they had to discredit the czars. They had to discredit the history of Russia and also the literature of Russia, the the Christian foundations of Russia. They had to discredit it all, and that's and that's how they went about doing it. Romania, it was the same thing. When they when they came in, they had to systematically destroy the cultural foundations in order to convince the people of communism. There was like three hundred churches, I think it was. I don't remember how many, but it was it was something like three hundred churches that were like hundreds and thousands. I don't know about thousands, but hundreds of years old that they had just destroyed. They just mm -hmm. raised. In Islam fact, it, does the exact same thing. As far as destroying like old churches or anything that goes against anything that's not Muslim, yeah. Well, yes, yeah, so, some. There's yes, a lot. Some between, Muslim sects between yes. Islam and communism. You see a lot of parallels, and so just an interesting factoid. And you look at the Chinese uh, Cultural Revolution. That's also very similar where they where they had to destroy the existing culture they had to destroy the existing religions they had to destroy the existing philosophies and kill millions of people who would refuse to submit in order to convince the more docile and more pliant subjects which is most people in order to make it their way and then they still ended up killing 50 to 60 million people through bureaucratic incompetency with the uh, with the uh, um, with the famine mm -hmm. and what's interesting is you know we're we're told we're told by some of these idiot wizards of smart and I you know I say wizards of smart I'm talking about the like ex <laughs> the experts right we, we have these so-called experts that they talk about oh look at how efficient and how great the, the the Chinese system is they figured out how to combine the the wealth creation of capitalism with the with, with the uh, with the efficiency of a uh, of an authoritarian state and I'm thinking do you not know the story it's, of the famine of the China, the Chinese famine in the 50s and 60s the state has absolutely that no which efficiency. our government I mean, our no, our, our parents, all of our parents raised us, right, saying they're starving children in uh, China. Finish all the food on your plate, right? <laughs> Do you remember that stupid line? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. that's I always said that came well, then they from the famine. Lived here. So the reason why the the reason why that famine happened was because all bureaucrats wanted to prove how great they were doing. Because if you if you said anything. To the contrary, like, oh yeah, we're we're not going to be able to meet our quota for crop yields in our province. Well, what's going to happen? Yeah. You're off with your head. You're going to be gone and replaced. So, what do you think every one of those bureaucrats is going to say? They're going to respond with, we're oh yeah, crop. we're we've got a bumper crop. We're doing better than ever. And all that goes back up to Beijing, and so Mao. He's thinking, oh yeah, we've got we've got a bumper crop across the board. The communist system's working so well. We're gonna we're we're so prosperous because look at all these extra crops. We're gonna be able to sell crops to other countries. This is great. And then what had happened? It was actually a massive famine. There was n not even close to the amount of food to provide for people. Fifty million people starved because of bureaucratic incompetency and. Yes, Menning. So, you you want to know why freedom is so important? It's that right there. Freedom to own your own land, to provide your own food, is what allows you to actually make sure you have enough for yourself. And strange thing is, is when you have enough for yourself, 
then you start becoming charitable and start sharing it with others, and everybody gets wealthier. It creates a community. You depend on each other, not the, the government. Well, let's... Uh, and why we're still fighting this stupid battle that I thought in 1989 we all agreed, hey, yeah, you know this communist thing? Yeah, this is pretty stupid. <laughs> I thought as a globe we all went, yep, yep. No, everybody failed. else has done it wrong. <laughs> Exactly. As if there were a right way to do it. And, well, and that's why it, 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 that it irritates me that we're still fighting this stupid ideological battle. That wasn't true. Insert your favorite form of despotic government. <laughs> well, and speaking of, the more you have, the more generous you are. Um, so, like, Assuming you're not an a-hole. Yeah, which there always will be. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's some people will. You yeah. might even say, assuming but you've been taught by goodly parents, most, then you're not going to be an a-hole, yeah. and you're going to you're going to treat your wealth mm -hmm. as a blessing to be shared. Most people will. Most yeah. people, the better off they are, they're compelled to help those who have not been as as fortunate as they have. I think that's a pretty you know common trait of people. Unless you're from a poor poor place, then they probably hoard it. I don't know. Not necessarily. I mean, I think even in poor places, I mean, you look at places like the Philippines, mm -hmm. they're extremely ge generous people. They may be very poor, but they they will bend over backwards to try to help you yeah. and treat you good. Now, granted, the common trait there is they're also Christian. <laughs> and they're devoutly Christian. Yeah. So, that may have a factor in it. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if we look at this from a let's look at it from a, a monetary um, success in the last thirty years, the entire world is more rich than it's ever been. The entire world, from the top to the bottom, has all been moving up, being mm -hmm. more successful through all the advancements and, and and automation and everything. The entire world, everybody is doing so much better. But the dollar doesn't go as far as it did in 1970, and you hear the people complain. Hear people complaining about, well, our parents were able to have a house and and a car and and make the make their ends meet, with more to spare on minimum wage. Yes, they did. They made a lot. They could do a lot more. It was more also with a much lot crappier less. house. No, Maybe. and I say but, that as an architect looking from the standpoint of codes. Uh, our, our building codes have pushed us into much more expensive housing. Yeah. So even even if you discount the monetary stuff, the fact that you could build a house in a much more low standard quality in terms of like, you know, it, it's no hardly any insulation to speak of. Mm -hmm. Usually you had single pane windows and they were much smaller homes, smaller bedrooms, smaller bathrooms, mm -hmm. smaller kitchens in general, you know, in general, everything was a lot cheaper. Codes have actually forced standards a lot higher. And so you know, people say, oh, yeah, I can't afford Well, what kind of house? Are you just trying to get a house as big as daddy? Because that might be your problem is if you're trying to get a really fancy house. That's one thing that really impresses me about Fred is that even though he, he has a good salary, mm -hmm. but for the last few years, he's lived in a... A very small, modest house mm -hmm. with his family, and it works great for them. Fred's a pretty good dude, but I won't tell him that I said that. I'll, I'll keep that. Se I'll keep that secret too, Mitch. <laughs> Let's not tell him. But yeah, so the um, the world's wealth has grown, but it doesn't go as far. And that's you know that's part of the thing. It's it's the abuse of taxes and and the overregulation is what. It's kind of like, it's not just, you know, over-regulation in the housing industry. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. Everybody's getting taxed a lot higher and a lot heavier than they ever did. And it's not to say I don't people, agree with some of those regulations. Um, yeah, some of them have their place, but there's far more regulations than need be. And regulations like, for cost example, money. the Americans with Disabilities Act, I actually love what that did to architecture. That really helped improve the quality of bathrooms and doorways for everybody, not just people in wheelchairs. Because have you been into old buildings and seen old public restrooms? Yeah. They're crappy. They're horrible. 
And the newer ones are much more spacious, wide open, you feel more comfortable and safe. They have handicap stalls, so you really have room to just freaking grab onto rails and bear down. <laughs> Yes, those grab bars do come in handy sometimes. <laughs> Especially after eating some Mexican food. Man, you might... <laughs> Double fisted. <laughs> but, no, that's, that's, that's the problem. And, and so people... The government has decided that... Well, people aren't going to be as generous on their own, so it's our job to provide generosity and to legislate that you be generous with your money. And that's a big issue. Give people a chance to be generous and let them keep more of what's theirs, and they will be. Mm -hmm. The thing that really makes me sad about the whole enforced, like the, the enforced idea of transferring wealth is when people get money from the government, it's, you, you have the sense of like, oh, I paid taxes, I deserve it. And like, there's, there's no gratitude. But when you have a neighbor that, that steps forward and helps you out when you're in a, in a bind, there's a sense of gratitude and there's a sense of paying back to the community. There's a sense of you want to you want to make sure you pay it forward to someone else. But if the government's just giving you money, it's just some unknown entity that you really don't have many experiences with of except for when you pay taxes. And you there's there's no sense of like of honor in that. It's just a it's just a part of life. But community I deserve commu this. Yeah, exactly. But but when you have a neighbor who brings by food and and you needed it, or when you have somebody who brings by Christmas presents, or when you have somebody that who who pays a bill or something for you that you don't, even if you don't know who it is, but you know it's somebody in your community, it's just like it builds that not just like not just in your home, but in your community, it builds that that sense of of mutual goodwill, mm -hmm. and you you miss that when the government is in between. The government tries to solve these problems because they say that people aren't good enough to do it themselves. And and so it gives a moral justification. But everybody misses the entire aspect, the entire point that anything the government touches is worse. Yep. So much worse. They destroy everything they touch. I swear. <laughs> I've never seen anything the government has meddled with that has worked. So, at least relatively So kind of like good. King Midas in reverse? Yeah. Is he the one that touches everything and turns to gold? Yeah. I was just thinking that. Yep, they touch it, it turns to shit. Yeah. Literal, literal turns. And, and, and I think going forward, I think that's really the solution, though, is what we've all experienced is those, those goodly neighbors, and I'm sure we've also done our fair share of helping out neighbors when no, in a time them. of need. You know, that kind of stuff, you know, but not, not because you were asked to. You, you help somebody out because you just, you know, it's the right thing to do. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And and also because so, a lot of times you do it because you love your neighbor, you know. You, that that kind of Christian ethic, I think that's really what is more important than all this stuff in, in Washington, D.C. You know, like, is just how we treat each other as a community locally. And I, I think it's too often we focus too much on the national politics and we think, oh, well... Oh, we got to make sure that our our man wins for president. You know, it's like, you know how little power the president actually has. He mm -hmm. he may have a ton of power, but you know, actually has a much bigger effect on your daily life. Congress, your local city council. I don't have a city council. Or your county board of supervisors, or whatever your <laughs> local government is, um, they actually have a huge amount of power over your daily life, and it's something that the the left, especially, and but you know, for that matter, politicians in general, like the, you know, thieving minds of both parties, have known this for a long time but they always focus on the national because that's the more sexy political discussion to have right is to discuss the national well politics. they can distract people to look at it at the national level but the while local the corruption level is ruins where, everything locally yeah the local level is where the real stuff happens and us and see as an architect i'm dealing with that on a daily basis because my whole entire 
you know, my my whole entire dealing is with local city governments because as I push through a set of plans, I have to get the building permit. And so I'm going through a local city government and their process and how they do it. And I have my opinions on various cities around the state of Utah because I have to deal with a lot of these different cities and I know which ones that I've dealt with have been more, uh, more or less pleasant or horrible to work with. And it really depends on the, the mentality, the, the general ethos of the culture of that particular local government, which comes down to the people who are voting for those politicians. Because a lot of times, like for example, in my local city, we, we're a city of maybe 5,000 people. It's a very small city. Um, the, the winning candidate for mayor won uh, 650 votes to 630 votes. I mean, wow. it, it's, it's not exactly a big place. Well, you pretty much know most of the people in your local city if you've been there long enough. You'll know a lot of them, and you'll know kind of who they are, kind of their history. You might have even seen them at church. And so it makes a big difference. But you go into a place like Salt Lake City, I'm guessing it's probably about 250 to 300,000 people live in Salt Lake City now. You vote for mayor or city council in a big city like that, you might not know them or anything about them. It's such a big place that you have very little power as a local citizen to affect that change. And so one of the things I think we also need to see is a revision in the way we set up our cities is I think state governments need to establish a breaking point where cities have to divide into a federated system or at least into more local community council governments so that you have more local control and divest as much power away from the centralized power and as close to the people as you can. So you can have that re actual representation. Yeah. Interestingly enough, the city of Provo actually has, has a system like that. They actually have community councils. So each neighborhood actually elects their own community council. And they actually control even things down to like the architect, arch, architectural design standards for that neighborhood. Now, personally, I think that's a constitutional violation, um, you know, because I think that's a violation of free speech. Um, <laughs> my free speech in particular, I should be able to, to speak with my art in the form of the uh, buildings that I design. And so if I design a building with... Uh, purple stripes and pink polka dots and lime green triangles as a uh, facade pattern. That's my right. Architectural design standards for a city, I think, are unconstitutional. But nobody's willing to fight that fight in court. It's never going to happen because no architect in their right mind would want to burn the bridge with a city where they have to go in for a building permit. Because as soon as you sue the city over that, guess what? <laughs> you ain't ever getting a p permit issued in that city ever again. But I wish somebody would fight that court fight. I'll do it. <laughs> so let's build a, let's, let's build a green, green and purple polka dot uh, building. He'll probably want just something phallic. Just something phallic. So, uh, so dude, you want, this building looks like a penis. <laughs> so you want? So you no, want? Doesn't. So you want the aerial? So you want the aerial castle? <laughs> <laughs> what? Is, oh my gosh! There's a penis on here, dude. As soon as I saw that, I ran upstairs with that movie case and showed my brother so fast. I'm like, look, there's a penis here and a cheeseburger right there. <laughs> I didn't know about the cheeseburger. That's what I saw. Oh man. That's awesome. I love cheeseburgers. <laughs> I do too, obviously. <laughs> I mean, you don't get this beautiful body shape. You're not one of us. What are you so talking you about? Just back off. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Poser. <laughs> are you trying to call me skinny? <laughs> yeah, I am. That's a first. Nobody's ever tried to call me skinny. Do you look like me? 
<laughs> then shove it. Okay? You're not one of us. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yes, I'm discriminating against you. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Of course, things have happened. Just consider the source. Just consider the source. <laughs> oh, man. Fred, you've been awful quiet today. You guys talk a lot. But it's good things. So I don't mind. You talk a lot. When I go, I do. The only thing I was going to say, we were talking a while ago about how politicians do one th say one thing and do another. It's just like that whole old concept of actions speak louder than words, I think is, is forgotten in a lot of senses. It's just like you, you, hear, you hear people get so offended by, by people not saying the correct words or saying the, the wrong words out of order or the, in the wrong way or whatever. And it's just like... Actions speak far louder than words, and I think the politicians are are far. Um, it's 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 far harder to keep them in line based off of the things that they do versus the things they say. Yeah, and if you're honest with yourself, you know, you can see right through it when people don't actually mean what they say. Yeah, it's so easy to see it. But you have to be honest enough with yourself to actually be looking for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's... Uh, I, I've always wondered why so many people willfully um, blind themselves to the truth. I, 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 I don't understand it. Like, why do they willfully try to convince themselves that, you know... For example... You know, and, and I know this is kind of like the, the whipping boy of, of modern uh, conservative talking points. But, you know, to go back to the whole transgender thing, it's like, you know, the, the, the idea that a man can be a woman and, and, and have a period. And it's like, and I know that's kind of a tired thing on YouTube now is like a bunch of conservatives complaining about the transgender thing. That's, that's the thing. It's like but people who are... Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think it's endemic of the... the, the, the it's endemic of this whole, you know, putting on the blinders and ignoring truth because you, you want to believe in a particular ideology. There, what I was going to say is, like, people are, um, it's, it's tiring for you because you've seen through it. But there are a lot of people in the conservative, a lot of Republicans who consider themselves conservative have no idea that this argument's been going on. They're completely ignorant to it. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I think the whole reason, one of the reasons why we do that as far as we, we let people lie and then don't hold them to their, their own standards is because we, part of it is that false idols. You know, you, you get a hero worship where you want to say, okay, this is a good person. And so you begin to worship that person as far as like, you no longer think for yourself and you abdicate to their judgment. And it's like, oh, this person's a good person, and he said that, so it can't be that bad. And mm -hmm. and you don't dig any deeper. And because you do that so that you can move on with your life and do whatever. You don't have to think about this subject anymore. And it's it's a way of, of, of um, forfeiting our own agency, but also of worshiping false gods, you know? Well, and I, and I do think that most people do not want to have anything to do with, like, paying attention to politics. Most people really just want to live their lives. They just want to enjoy their, um, they, they want to enjoy their sports or their, or whatever hobby it is that they've, they're into. They don't want to pay attention to issues of philosophy and religion and politics and, and things that, um, have bearing on what ends up happening in real life. And 2020 was kind of a weird year because it it forced everybody to become interested in politics, including the politically ignorant and the low the and the 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 low information voter, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about people who they spent more time knowing exactly what Kobe Bryant was eating for his um, for his supper on the third of December 
um, you know, two two years ago, than to know what the Constitution says. Yeah. And it's like, okay, that's great that you like. You, it's great that you like basketball. Okay, it's it's a fun sport, but is it really? Is it really something that has eternal meaning? I mean, after all, once you, once that buzzer sounds and the final score is posted, everybody goes home. Everybody goes home. That there, there's there's no actual eternal consequence to the effect of a sporting game. But it gives the the regular man, the normie, um, a chance to feel tribal in a safe area. A chance mm -hmm. to feel. A combative and a safe area, so it so it tickles that that masculine need for competition. What I find interesting, so you and and since you know Romanian, what's the Romanian word for sport? Uh, Bloodbath. Well, nici cum un sport, ni. I would say nici cum un sport. Oh, okay. So, but but uh, I, I mean, may be confusing it with uh, the word for fun. Distractive. Distractive. Yeah, distractive. Yeah, because. Because that that's it's distractive. Me, that's something that I've I, I was always amazed by when I when I learned that part of Romanian was the word for fun is distractive, and it's like oh, it's a distraction, mm -hmm. and that's how I see sports. That's how I see um, Hollywood movies. Uh, you know, like these things are distractions. Yes, they're fun, but they're not. They have no eternal consequence. They take us away from things of actual value. Yeah, I was thinking about it. I've been, I've been lately. I've been kind of going into stoicism, right? I've been thinking about stoicism, and um, I've been trying to learn more. I started reading Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. That's that's um, on my reading list uh, too. And it's just it's it's interesting. The and I was thinking about. I've done a little bit of study about like um, like I've done a little bit of study in psychology and stuff like that. And last night it came to the idea. And I have no idea if there's any merit to this this idea or not. But it, I, I went, I stopped, and I went and asked my wife, and we were just talking about it for a while. And the whole concept, so Freud's concept of the subconscious, the the I was looking at the Stoic philosophies, and a lot of the like a lot of the Stoic philosophies reside in discipline, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like you 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 either focus on the things that you can control. Or the things that you can't control. You make the decision if you can control it or not. If you can influence it or not. If you can't control it, you ignore it. It's not you. It doesn't matter. Your opinion doesn't matter. What you do doesn't matter. You won't change the weather if you uh, if you yell at the person who's uh, running that snowplow or whatever. You know, it's it's still going to be snow in front of you. So so it, it's it's a waste of time and energy to focus on that. You focus on the things you can actually affect, and and then. You have to. It requires a, an incredible discipline. Well, coming back to the whole Freudian idea of the subconscious, I was thinking like, what if the subconscious, this whole concept of sub, of subconscious, is just a false concept, and our actual belief in the subconscious gives the subconscious power? And the thing that took me to that was like, what if we, um, what if we are using the subconscious as a uh, an excuse for us to not take responsibility for our thoughts. It's like, oh, it's subconscious. I didn't think of that. You know, you get into a lot of like the unconscious bias. You get into a lot of like the unconscious thinking and stuff. And it's like, well, like what if the actual discipline it has to control your thoughts is really like our, our belief in the subconscious is what actually creates the subconscious in your mind. It's like, I, I don't know if that's true or not or anything, but it's just, it, it, it came to my mind of like how much, how, how powerful our minds are if we can actually discipline them. Have you ever read the book *The Power of Hab Habit* by uh, Charles Duhigg? Um, I've heard of it. I don't think I've ever read it. Okay, so that that book talks a little bit of a similar concept, um, in that the, the what what Freud was calling subconscious, uh, I think, is actually more the hip the habits that we create. Those habits that we create actually create subroutines. And, you know, you being a computer programmer, you, mm -hmm. you understand this really well. Mm -hmm. The idea of a subroutine is something that basically runs in the background. You don't have to think consciously about it. Just happens. And it's something that our brain does on a regular basis. Our brain constantly is creating um, subroutines so that we can focus on the higher orders of conscious thought. The things that are 
the things that require more intense focus and energy to contemplate because if we had to if we had to consciously think about every step that's required in order to breathe mm -hmm. it would drive us nuts right because it's not exactly it's not exactly an easy thing i mean yeah, it's I mean, easy oh, because we it do it all the these time. muscles, do these muscles, you know. Yeah, yeah. but there's there's, like, there's so much going on that. Yeah, how many muscle groups don't think are about. involved in mm -hmm. just the simple act of breathing? Mm -hmm. And if we had to manually send every single command to every single nerve ending of every single muscle in our body that affects breathing, we wouldn't be able to handle it. So our brain has a ton of processing power to create these subroutines and have these habitual things just happen in the background. So anytime we're creating a habit, what we're basically doing is we're telling our brain, okay, this is something that I want to do on a regular basis. This is something that I don't want to have to think about. I just want to do. So please write a, please write a program for this and make it happen so that I can focus on other things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think to your, to your word, you know, about Marcus Aurelius and, um, and Epictetus and, and the uh, Stoics, that really is, you know, one of the things that they're pushing is the concept of discipline. And what is discipline if it's not practicing good habits? Mm -hmm. The thing that it, that it made me think of is like a lot of like, look at your modern day, the way that kids are taught in school and stuff. A lot of the reasons that they believed so much stuff that they're taught in school that is just ludicrous is because, one, they don't have exposure to that kind of thinking. And two, it it you're training your brain to accept things that that it takes a buildup to accept. Like, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It doesn't – like, you have to learn simple things before you can learn more complex things. But also yeah, – you're not going to be able to do trigonometry without first learning – arithmetic yeah exactly but that being said you also when when you sprinkle in lies or you sprinkle in things that are false into that nature you can't have a perspective that is flawed without accepting things that are flawed you know what i mean mm -hmm. so i don't know i was just i was just thinking about like how the, the one of the things and i was telling mitch this last week off camera but one of the things that really fascinates me is how we can take different um, inputs in our minds, like different evidence from one thing or another, and we can draw different, completely different conclusions based off of what what points of the evidence we focus on or what points we believe in. You know what I mean? Or or even just down to the source, right? The source can affect w whether or not we take it as a credible source, right? Mm -hmm. And that can affect our view on it. For yeah. example, when I see something published by the New York Times, my immediate response is gee, I wonder if that's true. <laughs> yep. Or, what kind of clap track are they trying to sell me this time? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, and that's largely just due to the fact that I've got enough life experience to know that the New York Times is basically, it's, Basi it's basically bumwad. It's it, it's toilet paper. It, it, they they publish a bunch of lies on there all the time, always pushing an agenda that is not a righteous agenda for 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 dang sure. And people will buy it as truth. Yeah, because it's the paper of record, right? Well, why is it the paper of record? Oh well, look at all the Pulitzer prizes that they have. Okay, who founded the Pulitzer Prize? And why did he? Why did Pulitzer start that prize? It was a it was a mechanism in order to legitimize illegitimate journalists. It was a mechanism to you know, like for example, George Bernard Shaw, total shyster. That guy was a complete waste of skin when it came to like he he, he was a communist. I mean, an out and out communist. But yet he's treated. As though he was this great philosophical thinker. And I think there's similar uh, similar things that could be said for a lot of philosophers and a lot of thinkers, including Freud. Where, again, <laughs> Freud was, he was a shyster. He was not a legitimate thinker. He, for one thing, he was a pervert. I mean, he Isn't spent more time... Huh? Is that all psychologists? 
No, no, not all of them. But with Freud specifically, he was very much into masturbation and um, pornography, and um, he was also a coke addict, constantly doing cocaine. Hell yeah, I like him even more now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and yet, you, and yet a cocaine addict like uh, Sigmund Freud has such sway over so much oh, of the population. Well, because he was legitimized by other illegitimate people who all, in a cabal, created this conspiracy to create this image of, yeah, okay, th these are legitimate people. It's funny that you say conspiracy. Did the video fail? Yeah. How long ago? <laughs> are we taking a break? Sure. <laughs> That's probably a good spot. <laughs> No, it's and that's that's a really good point that you bring up with the with the Pulitzer Prize and with the New York Times and stuff because you see how far down it's traveled. Just like with that magazine that my that they sent home with my daughter, Scholastic, printing mm -hmm. propaganda, and they get the kids when they're young and impressionable because mom and dad don't really pay attention to what's going on and they don't teach them the values of freedom and and everything. So. Yeah, a you lot know, of these really... publications, they were actually started with the specific aim of legitimizing communist thought. Mm -hmm. and They've been working on this game for a long time. Oh, yes. A long time. In fact, a, a book that I would highly recommend... But if you say anything about it, you're a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, a book they... I would highly recommend would be uh, the, uh, the uh, at least the first, the first bit. Uh, the middle of the book, it's really boring. But uh, the 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 book is called The Devil and Karl Marx by Paul Paul Kangor. I've heard of that book. Yeah. So the first few chapters are are really great. The last chapter is really great. The parts in the middle get kind of you know <laughs> really tiring. Um, so it's not a Tom Clancy book where it's really slow for the first no, pages. No. No. But. Uh, <laughs> But what you get from the book is you, you you learn about how this has been a long, drawn-out plan to subvert Christianity and to, and to subvert our traditional values mm -hmm. in order to sell people on the idea of the communist belief system. But the thing is, so many people fall for it. When, of course. When it, when it should be so clearly and painfully obvious that, yeah, you might not have to work you're going to suffer worse than you are now. And all oh. the power, all the authority, all in the hands of a handful of people. Mm -hmm. How are you not smart enough to gather this? Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the, the thing that amazes me is that people throw around the word socialist as though socialist is somehow different than communist. But if you actually study... Karl Marx's writings, he talks about socialism as the dictatorship of the proletariat that gets you to the utopia of communism. The reason why they say communism's never been tried is because it hasn't. Communism is actually the utopia or the heaven that the communists are trying to get to. Socialism is the dictatorship that gets you there. Well, wait, so you're saying that you have to give supreme ultimate power to a small handful of people in order to get to this strange utopia where there is no government and everybody is equal and has everything in common? Um, so why are these people with all this power going to give up their power? I mean, yeah, you, you, you're trying to suggest that somehow we can change the nature of man. Well, it makes you wonder how much the, these people actually believe that they're, if they believe they're benevolent at all. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Look at how, look how great and compassionate and wonderful I am of a leader. I don't see how someone like Xi Jinping um, even, know, even doubts that he's not the bad guy. He's got to know. I mean, because we believe, as Christians, we believe in the light of Christ. We believe that all people are born into this world with the light of Christ in them and the capability of recognizing good from evil. Mm -hmm. I think Xi Jinping 
knows damn well sure that he is subverting the will of God. But he's convinced himself that there is no God. That there he's constantly trying to tell himself that he is he himself is God. And that's why they go so crazy. I think that's, well, that's why you, hear the... you look at someone like Kim Jong Un uh, of of North Korea. Do we figure out How if he's crazy. dead or alive yet? I just hope he is still alive because his sister is a demonic little b word. <laughs> you know, that's that's the thing about. But you know, they about, go crazy. Is my point. Megalomaniacs. Yeah. They always go crazy, psycho, insane. Because the power not only corrupts them in terms of becoming evil, but it also corrupts their minds and causes them to just be really bizarre and weird, like in their behavior and their 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 mental functions. Because I I think that mental discord between what they know in their heart is right, because they cannot not know that mass murder is evil. Well, do you think that that ever goes away I don't that, think you... that basic knowledge of right and wrong do you think I mean some people are crazy I don't think it ever does I think everybody deep in their heart still knows right from wrong I would I would but think they so. get so convinced of their own self-righteousness that they ignore all the warnings of the spirit yeah I don't know. I try to be a good person. Not nice, but good. <laughs> you can only do so much. You can polish up a turd and put a bow on it, but at the end of the day, it's still a turd. Huh. I, think, I think my mom used to say it a, a little bit different than that. Well, she's probably more professional than I. <laughs> she, she, she would always say you can, you, you, you can take a horse, uh, you can... Put you lipstick can. on a pig? Oh, yeah, maybe it was that. But lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig, yeah. Then you ruin your good lipstick. You have lipstick? What? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to take it in a weird direction. I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> it was an exploratory time. <laughs> All the cool kids were doing it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, they weren't. <laughs> the ag department, you kept wondering why there's lipstick all over their pigs. Well, then again, I guess I wouldn't know because I've never been cool a day in my life. So I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what the cool kids were ever doing. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah, that was okay. never cool. <laughs> They're all such douchebags, so I don't care anyway. Well, that's, that's, that's the fun thing about that is like now that I'm older, you know, now... Now that I can look back at it, I can go, thank God I wasn't cool. Thank God I was never cool. <laughs> because one of the things about being a social reject um, in high school was that I learned how to accept the fact that people were going to insult you and vilify you because you're different and mm -hmm. not conforming to the social norms of whatever clique you're in. And the, the superpower that gives you is that it allows you to... It allows you to just let criticism just roll off your shoulder mm -hmm. and just be yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, yeah, I'm a societal misfit, big as hell, <laughs> you know, and I'm okay with that. Good on because the other good people, on for you. the other people that I associate with, are also societal misfits. Yeah, and you know all these people who are cool and in the in the groove and in the fit and everything. They'll betray in heartbeat backstabbers. Mm -hmm. Their loyalty means absolutely nothing to them. If they have to sacrifice somebody to stay in that spotlight, to stay in that socially acceptable range, they'll do it. They'll throw people under the bus in a heartbeat to stay on the top. Whereas the misfits, shit, we'll all burn together. Well, to be fair, though. People are people everywhere, you know, as far as like, regardless of what group you did, what you go yeah. be part of, there's going to be people that, ha that value loyalty. There's going to be people who are 
who are for their own gain or their own oh benefit, absolutely absolutely you know absolutely um but there are definitely the groups and the factions that are much more likely faults that are much more likely to do it who are more prone to that naturally yeah yeah that makes sense yeah, yeah. screw those people <laughs> i'll take loyalty over anything else yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, um, Tim Poole was uh, reporting this on his YouTube channel once about the, uh, the, uh, the I, I forget what it was called, but the, uh, the personality or the, there's something about the personality profile with uh, conservatives or liberals or something like that. And it found that um, of all the people, the people with the most well-balanced um, set of values like where like they have you know loyalty newness uh conservation of old ideas uh tr you know tradition you know like basically all these different principles and values the people who had the most well-balanced val you know value system tend to be conservatives and the people who are the most one-sided lopsided into just one value yeah you can guess it that's because they pro liberals. They project it. They project what they do onto the other side, and then they're they're so conceited, they're so brainwashed that they actually believe that what they're doing is what the other side's doing. They project it and they believe it. In their conceit, they thought they could build a tower to God. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, you're just a horrible person. Because. I understood that reference. <laughs> I mean, it's it's such a great story too. We're seeing it today. We, we're seeing it today, especially with global warming and this, and people talking about trying to do carbon capture and all these fanciful engineering projects in order to solve the problem of global warming, which and is naturally like, occurring. You, you, you <laughs> don't see the conceit. I mean, do you really not see the conceit of thinking that you are so godlike that you actually understand? A, a a a complex the, system the, like the, the environment. Entire, yeah, the, the a complex system like the environment that has millions, if not billions, of variables. But you've simplified it down to a simple mathematical model. Going right back to the Big Bang theory, right? Mathematical model. Oh, okay. Well, the model's not f fitting reality, so we're going to invent a new variable, right? Um, it's the same thing in, in global warming. The, the climate is so much more complex than the variables that they've accounted for in their mathematical models. In but yet they know they know and it's 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 it's. I'm uh, really smart, so I know. Science. I just have to prove it's, it. Uh, what, what's the? It's settled science. Settled science. And it's like settled. You realize that when you have to say settled behind science, you know that it's ever, not. Can it ever truly be settled? Exactly, because science... Nothing can ever truly be science, said. Science isn't a thing. It's a process of learning. Science is a method of learning, not a thing, not a belief system. <laughs> <laughs> and yet it's been turned into a religion by those who would use it politically to for seize control. power for their one world government. There's so... There's so many people communist. who believe that they're going to be at the top. So many people believe they're going to be up at the top. Well, every It's like, no! With this one world government, Nancy Pelosi, I'm sorry, you're a great tool, but you're see, just that, a tool. See, here's the thing. Living here in Utah, we know very well what that's called. You know, some people try to dress it up and call it, you know, call, you know, call it multi-level marketing. We all know it's a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> And everybody entering into the Ponzi scheme thinks that they're going to have all these downstream people who are going to be paying into that, again, yeah, making them rich. Yeah, they're going. But in the it. end, it's all a Ponzi scheme, and it's going to collapse in on itself eventually. And it's the same thing with centralized power; it cannot endure forever. It will always collapse eventually. It might last for a couple hundred years, like the Roman Empire did. Um. We've been going at it a couple hundred years. Yeah, but we're still in our re technically in our republic phase. Yeah. 
I don't think we'll leave the Republic phase. Try as they might, I don't think it'll happen. I sure because, hope we don't. Because there's enough people who aren't willing to let it leave the Republic stage. Because, let's face it, Americans, we're different. We're special. We're different than the rest of the world in the way that we think in our best. I mean, there's so many people here that are armed, that are trained, you know, literally willing to die not to be ruled. And there's so many people just, you know, there's so many people. Just because you don't make a law doesn't mean that people will follow it. Here's the or weird, you can enforce here's it. the weird part. I mean, there's so many people in this country who have pocket constitutions, who study the constitution on a regular basis, like the beautiful viewers of this uh, podcast. <laughs> Yeah, the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> did I just call myself beautiful? You did. <laughs> I didn't mean and so. That and that in, in and of itself was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> very conceited. <laughs> but very, very conceited. But I, I know how that, beautiful I am. What, what I mean by that is like all the people out there throughout this country, and I believe that there are a lot of them, they may still be a um, small minority of the entire population, but I think there's, as as God said to Lot or to Abraham, even if there's one righteous person, he would not destroy the uh, the city, right? Yeah. And that's why he had to tell Lot to get out so he could destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And then his wife looked back and turned into salt. I, I like that part. Well, she was a hoser. <laughs> No way, eh? <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> you, you mean a boot? <laughs> so I said a boat. Oh, okay. You're talking about. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think there's enough of us out there. I agree with you. I just, I just wonder what well, that's going to do. For example, like I know where my people are going to end up. Because in the veteran community, dude, you shafted us so hard, we ain't going to be on your side. <laughs> and you made a big mistake by doing that because you taught us how to fight a war and you brought us home, left us to our own devices and betrayed us and stabbed us in the back shit comes full circle because loyalty is important to us and you freaking shit all over it mm -hmm. yep. we're the type of people who believe that traitors deserve to die a traitor's death so because our that's our whole life our it's, entire you know, lives some, revolved some around hate speech against a bunch of politicians. I don't give a shit. They're not people. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the, our our entire lives, our entire existence for the time that we were over there. She's bleeding. I know. I've seen it. Um, I've been seeing. Our entire she spits them up over there. Our lives and our existence, probably from eating wood. That's what I was thinking. Um, revolved revolved around that loyalty, and they just. They literally shit all over it, and so, I mean, you're gonna get, you get what you deserve. Just like uh, Joaquin Phoenix said before he shot, what's his face? Robert De Niro. You, ha you guys haven't seen the new Joker with Joaquin Phoenix. I haven't seen The hair lip Joker. That I've heard a lot of, a lot of uh, really good things about it. It's really dark. Um, but I just haven't been... This has been such a dark year that I just haven't had the heart to watch such a dark film. <laughs> but uh, some I, of us are dead inside. So I, I don't know if you follow Critical Drinker on YouTube. No, he's he's absolutely my favorite uh, film critic. Um, he's he's a um, he's a Scottish guy, very uh, very much I think in our line of thinking. Mm -hmm. Like um, aligned with us politically, like the the way we would think and stuff. But um, his whole shtick is that he pretends to be drunk while he's doing the uh, the the critical review of a movie. Uh -huh. And it's so it's kind of a co comedy bit. But they're they're really good. Um, they're really good. And when he did his review of uh, of that new Joker movie with Joaquin Phoenix, uh, I mean that was one of the rare new films that he actually said was really good. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, there it was it. it was really dark, but it was a pretty good movie. Well, yeah, I, I'll definitely have to go look uh, look it up and watch it, but on my own time, <laughs> away from the fam, because <laughs> I'm guessing that my wife and kids would not want to watch it. 
My wife watched it. We didn't let our kids watch it. <laughs> my, my wife's more into Hallmark Christmas films this time of year. She doesn't really want anything sad. And Christmas is over. <laughs> now uh, she'll watch, the she'll bleak, watch our bleak existence she'll here. She'll watch our Hallmark Christmas world. films any time of year. <laughs> my dad does too. Don't you, Dad? Your dad does? I'll watch it for the scenery. Uh-huh. I'm uh-huh. sure you do, Jeffrey. Well, actually, the last Christmas movie we watched, uh, we we actually literally were watching it for the uh, scenery because it was filmed in Bountiful. Mm. <laughs> Who wants to it's film like, a movie? Hey, in I know that shop. Who wants to film a movie in Utah? Apparently, a lot of people. That's stupid. Mm-hmm. Utah sucks. <laughs> yeah, Utah does suck. That's our message to everybody who lives outside of Utah. Utah sucks. This place blows. Yeah, it's horrible. Don't come here. Especially if you're in Cal- from California. Or New York. It, or especially New York. if you're from New York. Stay away. If you want to move out here, you've got to just, you've got to acknowledge the fact that in the vast majority of our state, there's an AR-15 rifle in the back seat of most trucks. <laughs> and that is not an exaggeration. Yep. <laughs> So, I mean, don't, don't expect me to change for you, because I won't. Yeah, I saw a statistic that Davis County, Utah, it has the third highest gun ownership rate um, uh, per capita in the U.S. Hell yeah. The first two the first two counties were both in Texas, though. Texas is imploding. They've so. gotten all them Californians. Well, anyways... Do do we want to do we want to wrap it up? We've been going for two hours and fifty minutes. You're welcome. Wow, you're you're the host, man. Yeah. Well, welcome to today's. <laughs> welcome. Yep. We're glad you came and joined uh, us for today. Well, friends, glad you came. <laughs> All right, feelings mutual. <laughs> Um, You're glad Fred came? I'm okay with it. I think we're out of wood almost. So, well, no, it was a pleasure coming and definitely a pleasure being here with you guys. Um, we'll have to do it again sometime. Agreed. I liked Agreed. it. You're going to have to come up here, though, because I'm, the chances of me going south anytime in the next six months, just with my work schedule, very slim. <laughs> Plus, so. it's the big city, and big cities suck. I would go down <laughs> to do a podcast with you again. I'm all, I'm I'm getting really sick and tired of being in the city. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to be there because I'm an architect, and it's really hard to make a good living as an architect out in the country. What did the knight say in Indiana Jones? What's that? You chose poorly. <laughs> well. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. You're welcome. Dave's watching. Well, and I like guess he's in it, so he's probably not going to watch this one. But well, but I, I guess or if he's going to stare I guess at the, I have to say, or I'm, he's going to stare at the screen intently. <laughs> <laughs> I always close my videos with, "I'm a colorblind architect. Peace out." Oh, <laughs> you're colorblind? <laughs> yeah, for real. Oh, yeah. It's not just play on Martin Luther King's uh, speech. It's actually a literal statement about me. I'm red, green, colorblind. Oh, yeah, that's weird. He's also an architect. I don't. I want to. I don't know. I. I, I, I I'm always tell, curious I as to how that, that actually. They need to choose their own damn colors. I'm colorblind. <laughs> <laughs> so how does that how does that work? Like when you're colorblind? Because what color is my truck? Oh, well, from this angle, I can't I can't see because I'm only seeing the back. I can see the chrome. <laughs> what are you talking about? The top part? Yeah. What color is my truck? I don't know. What color uh, does it appear to be? Like, how do you see red and well, green? Like what my, does it look like? Like, my vehicle's red. But, like, I, I see red just fine. It, it's it's more... Um, it's more something where, like, um, like a lot of uh, pinks will look gray, blues will look gray... Um, oh, really? Greens will look gray, um, and vice versa. Really? Like, a lot of times I'll see gray and it will look pink. You know, so it's like hmm. it's usually in those more subtle colors in between. I gotcha. So you, shifts. so you actually, you see the colors, but 
backwards almost? Is that almost? But the, uh, another weird part about it though is like if if I see a bunch of different shades of red, uh-huh. I'll see them all as red and be able to better identify shades of red than people with normal vision. Really? Hmm. So the way I try to explain it to people is. It doesn't mean that I can't see color. What it means is I just see color differently than other, than most of the population. Yeah. So, but what I was curious is like how how you, when you're colorblind, how your brain processes the color. Like, do you is it, it gray? Also is has it... to do with the with the with the cones and rods in your eye. Really. Um, genetically, it, it, it's always a genetic thing for colorblind. Um, statistically, ten percent of ten Amer- percent um, of men are colorblind. One percent of women are colorblind. Really? Yes, it is much more wow. common amongst men. And um, of the particular variants of colorblindness I have, there's about five or six different colorblindness types. Mm-hmm. My particular variants makes up three percent of the male population. Really? Which. You're a freak. Considering there's over a hundred, you know, there's what, 160 million Americans? That was no fun. Uh, American males? Uh huh. 3% of that? That means there's millions of us. Yeah. There's more of me. Well. <laughs> and well, I called you a freak and you didn't even acknowledge me, and that just took all the fun out of it. Dude. I'm upset with you. Dude, in middle school, I was constantly tormented and bullied. And called names. <laughs> I am like a, I am like an impenetrable fortress. I'm rubber, against and insects. you are glue. <laughs> I am literally rubber. <laughs> and I am literally the three fingers pointing back. <laughs> Some people are like, "You're so mean." I'm like, "Why would you ever take anything like when I say mean things like that?" Why would you ever take anything I say at face value? <laughs> Just well, know that it's out of fun. I'm trying to have fun, you know? Plus, I've gotten like, to know your sense of humor. You're such and a dick. I, I jive with it. Yeah? <laughs> yeah it's yeah. fun. See, because when people say terrible, awful things to me, I love it. I freaking thrive in that kind of it environment. It makes me laugh when people insult me. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's a higher form of society. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I guess but, I guess that's the bonus content for the Patreon supporters. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm gonna stop this now. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Check out Dave's podcast, the the colorblind Color architect, the freaky architect, <laughs> the freakish architect. That that that's a that's a different, very different uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, freaky. <laughs> Go to freakyarchitect.com. <laughs> Do you ever watch uh, How I Met Your Mother? Uh, no. Oh. So one of the main characters, his name's Ted Mosby. He's an architect. Okay. And there's a kid that he went to high school in one episode that I guess he stood up for because he was kind of nerdy in high school or something like that. Anyway, this kid that he stood up for ends up going on to be a porn star. <laughs> so his stage, his stage thing is... His stage name is Ted Mosby, and then there was there's a specific uh, video that he made or something that said Ted Mosby, sex architect. <laughs> oh, this is great. freaking funny. Anyway, okay. This is uh, not colorblind architect. Elders rising. Yeah. Elders rising. Yeah. There you go. Bye.